ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. Good evening, everyone. This is David Morgan. I'm Arlington's environmental planner and conservation agent. The August 15th, 2024 public meeting of the Arlington Conservation Commission shall be physically closed to the public, uh, conducted in a remote format, consistent with Chapter 2 of the Act of 2023 which extended remote participation in public meetings until March 31st of 2025. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and uh, the recording may be made publicly available. I'm putting a link in the chat now to the meeting materials. You may see that pop up again as other folks join so they can be providing the link as well. The Zoom chat feature may be used for questions and comments that contribute to the commission's proceedings. If it's used otherwise, it may be disabled at the chair's discretion. Public comment period will follow each hearing and the Conservation Commission encourages attendees to ask questions and offer comments during the public comment period. Chuck Taroni is our commission chair and we will facilitate tonight's meeting. Each vote taken during the meeting will be conducted via roll call vote and we begin with roll call attendance and agenda review. So over to you, Chuck. Okay. Oh, thank you, David. Um, so I'll go over the agenda first. So for tonight, we have minutes. We have two sets of minutes to approve tonight, then correspondence, administrative report, discussion, um, the proposal for Meadowbrook Park, and school wants to use that. We have a vote for town day to pay the fees, uh, five Mystic Lake, drive a certificate of compliance request, water bodies working group, tree committee, CPA committee, park and recreation, all reports that will be given tonight. Our hearings first on the list is Thorndike. Uh, spoiler alert, this is being continued to September 5th, but we'll go over that in more detail um, when it comes up in our agenda. And then we'll go on to the Medford Boat Club, Marnotomy Rocks Park, and followed up by the last uh, item on our agenda is 103 Thorndike. And that's right. And with that, I'll go and do the attendance. So Mike Gildas game. Present. Nathaniel Stevens. Present. Susan Chapnick. Here. David White. Here. David Kaplan. Present. Brian McBride. Present. Associate Me oh, Chuck Taroni is here. Associate members, Sarah Alfaro Franco. I believe she was off this meeting. And Eileen Coleman. Here. Eileen is here. Okay. And with that, we're going to quickly move into our first item on the agenda, which is the minutes. Minutes review. And the first one would be July or March 21st, is it we're going to start with March 21st, 2024. All right. Does anybody remember what happened on March 24th, 1st of this year? Um, I will scan quickly through it. Just I'll, I'll cover the high level items. You've had a chance to look at these before and I didn't receive any comments about this set of minutes. So I'll just note the agenda items chime in if you have anything to say about the notes for each point so we discussed the reimbursement for friends of spy pond park for work at um well spy pond park of course there's a request for certificate of compliance at 19 sheraton park usual updates from Water Bodies Working Group, to the committee. There's the Artificial Turf Study Committee at that time. Also CPA update. We had the RDA discussion for 36 Peabody Road. The Reservoir Road, that was a notice of heat.
and we approved that with conditions at this meeting. Request for determination of applicability at 459 missed it. We also issued a determination following that meeting. And there's the amendment to 88 Coolidge Roads, order of conditions continued, turned back place, I'm not sure that was continued to the full meeting. Then it's gone. So how about the uh, oh, uh, this is a correction about mounding. Brown bottom mounding. Yeah, I think I didn't review these. And the reason I didn't is because I know that Jennifer just kind of basically types verbatim what's, you know, on the recording. Um, so, I, you know, unless she couldn't understand a word, I, I don't see that it would be incorrect. Um, I will say I appreciate her doing this. I mean, it's 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 a Herculean effort. I think it's way too much minutes for the conservation commission i think nathaniel stevens had spoken you know uh, eloquently about what should be in the minutes previously and i've i've been trying recently to do minutes that are much shorter than this so that they're not so onerous not only for whoever ends up doing the minutes but for those that are reviewing it um so i just want to say that and then i'm going to make a motion to approve the minutes you know second second Daniel Stevens. Mike Kill this game. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Brian McBride. Oh, I guess for David's comment, I won't be voting tonight because it's not clear that I renewed my uh, membership in time. Until we get that straightened out, I'll pass. Uh... Okay. Make a note. Susan Chapman. Your... Yeah, I say yes, but I'd like to go back to that comment because I didn't understand it. Yeah, hold yes. on. Let's finish the vote. Right. Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, Susan. Um, Brian, can you please elaborate? I didn't understand. Yeah, I, th I think uh, when I was appointed last year, it may have been for a one-year term and it may have expired like August no. 1st or something. The terms are three years for the conservation. No, unless, he's unless filling a term. Taken over. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he he's took filling. over? Yeah, if you're taking over a term, it may be, it's like in Congress or something. Oh, it's, it's, okay. You could be fill, fulfilling someone else's term. So, Brian, have you been reappointed yet? I, I have not. And I didn't receive a letter <laughs> from the town manager. Yeah, nothing. I, I didn't realize this till last week or so, uh, and I haven't taken any action yet. So, but we're not even sure he was really a one year or a three year, are we, Nathaniel? Because, um, Pam, at the end of her her term, it was not like in the middle of her term. She left at the end of a term, and then let's sorry. Let's Brian. Let's hear from Brian. How did you okay. realize? What's what do you mean by you say you realize this? Oh, David Morgan told me. I think you've got a table or something, David. How did David find out? Or yes, I was reviewing. Um, I was looking at the ethics certification requirements and I noticed there that the terms, which uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the file now and I'm having a difficult time while I'm talking. The terms are, yeah, okay, that's why I'm on the wrong tab. Bear with me. Oh, I apologize. We're going to have to come back to this, but I recommend that Brian set this one out for purposes of not having. Any yeah, it seems unusual based on my experience, because you usually receive the letter from the select board uh, staff weeks, if not a month or so in advance, and you have to respond by saying you intend to uh, re-up. 
for an, another term, and then it's a pretty easy process, except for getting sworn in. Now, if you had said you didn't get sworn in, now that's something to pause on. But I agree. I don't know when this came in. Better safe than sorry. We have a quorum here. So if everyone agrees, we should just move on. That's okay. fine. But not to belabor this, however, if this is an issue, we need to look at past votes and make sure there was a quorum without Brian. So that's problematic. But I agree with you, Chuck. I, I, I've in my ten years on on here, I've never not gotten a gotten a notice, and they keep track um, mm. in the office. So I don't know. Yeah, I work with the time manager's office on this. I apologize for the confusion. And the town clerk should know as well. The town, yeah. I would check with both the town clerk and the town manager. Yeah. I'm around tomorrow, David. I'll I'll stop by or something tomorrow morning. Okay. Good. All right, great. Uh, and with that, we're going to move on to July 11th, 2024 minutes. All right, so there was, this was you, Susan, who mm -hmm. this, right? Thank you. Welcome. These are much more succinct, as you'll note. Uh, so was one question here that Susan offered to ensure that the bullets are consistent with the updated enforcement order for 66, 66R Douglas Street and 993 Mass Ave. And they are, I'm going to mark that as resolved. Great. Are there, I, I suppose there's- I think that was it that I had questions on. Oh. Yeah. I see there are several motions. I missed this meeting, so I was also catching up with these minutes. The order of conditions for Medford Boat Club, we likewise continued that one. 24 Sheraton Park, this one was also continued. 18 Hamilton Road. That one was closed and issued with conditions. And that place, of course, was continued. Okay, any comments, motions? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes and thank Susan for doing them. Thanks, Nathaniel. And second, is that a, also a second? I'll second it. Yeah, Great. Right. All right. <laughs> um, Mike Gildas game. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, that takes care of the minutes. Uh, so the cars from respondents received between the last two meetings is available to the public. Our full list, you can contact the conservation agent at the link that he'll provide in the chat or reach out to David Morgan uh, if you're having trouble. We have um, usual correspondence link and we have a Thorndike Place link. And with that, I'll turn it over to David Morgan for his update on the SIMS conservation restriction. We received notification from Brightview, which is the senior care, or I think it's memory care specifically, center at the uh, 360 property of Sims. They are party to the Sims conservation restriction along with the town in Arlington 360. We received the notice from them saying that they intend to transfer the property to a new owner. And I spoke with a legal department about this. I was under the impression that they could not transfer the property when there were outstanding issues with the conservation restriction, of which there are many, of course. And I was had that clarified for me that they are able to transfer it. The really the problem from legal's perspective is finding a prospective buyer who's willing to assume the rights and responsibilities of uh, a conservation restriction that's out of compliance. 
So with that, uh, the town will take no action until there's a new owner and they have been duly notified of their rights and responsibilities, as I say, and they'll need to pick up from there. The right view ownership remains liable in legal's opinion for the things that have transpired under their ownership. So the new owner will not necessarily be held to the same account, but they will have to sort of pick up the tab to some extent. So there, there's some negotiation. Uh, oh, beautiful. Uh, thank you, Sean, for looking into that and seeing in the chat that Brian was appointed through January 21, 2026. As of May 8th, 2023, the select board minutes reflect that. David, do you have a question about Sims? Oh, you're muted. How are you going to be sure that things aren't dropped in the property transfer? Is the legal department watching that? What's going on? It seems like it's a possibility for them to sometimes drop out altogether. I think there are two steps to that answer. One is that Arlington 360 is sort of the principal party involved. Brightview has been less uh, engaged in the conversations about the conservation restriction infractions. And so it's of less concern that they're transferring the property. They'll have to be notified, I understand regularly, of being party to the conservation restriction and not traveling with the land. They need to know what land they are purchasing, the new buyer. And so they need to be informed of that. We're all, i.e., the Conservation Commission is engaged with the Arlington 360 folks and uh, Brightview's ownership in terms of getting these problems addressed. And so I'm confident that we'll keep in the mix. Nathaniel's been the one sort of spearheading that since I was out on leave and I see I have a hand up Nathaniel. So Chuck, I don't want to take over facilitation for you, but. No, it's fine. Uh, it's, it's uh, just want to, hear from Nathaniel. I know that he has been, um, <clears throat> like you said, taken over and he's uh, probably has a little more information. So Nathaniel, please. Thanks. Uh, David, just a question for you. Did you sign those estoppel certificates that they sent to you or did Le legal said not to do anything? They said, do not sign. Do not sign. Okay. Thanks. I just mm -hmm. want to pass that on to the land trust. Yeah. Um, I had emailed president of the land trust stating that I intended not to sign and, you know, informing them that the letter was coming to them because it says, you know, CC in the letter. Um, so I haven't, I haven't heard back on that matter, but appreciate you following up with them. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I can give a brief update. I've been, uh, as David mentioned, when he went on parental leave, I helped out by uh, going to meetings with the Arlington 360 folks. As you all may remember, Beals and Thomas, the consulting firm Beals, Beals and Thomas did a survey of the perimeter of the property and the conservation restriction area and identified about, I'm trying to remember, maybe 50 encroachments. And we went back and forth about for a while, what to do with, our, again, primarily Arlington 360, Brightview has been totally in the background on all of this. Arlington 360 finally, kindly agreed to hire Beals and Thomas to essentially deal with this whole situation. So after further back and forth, they sent letters to most of the people who were identified as encroachment. Some of them we collectively decided not to pursue for a variety of reasons, but these are minor ones or ones that had been, looked like they had been there for 50 plus years or 
had uh, were the were the remnants of actually the Sims Hospital. There was one site where there's concrete dumped near someone's property, and there was debate about whether that it looked like rather than the the butter doing it, it looked like it was a remnant just from the from the Sims development. But anyway, so we're in the process of communicating, or I should say, Beals and Thomas is in the process of communicating with the abutters. I think they've reached all but two or three, <clears throat> and then we're at various stages of identifying who's to who's doing what by when. It's a slow process, but it looks like it will be a promising process. So that's the brief update. And the Arlington Land Trust President, Chris Like, has been attending most of the meetings via Zoom that I've had with the person from Beals and Thomas. Set. OK, so we'll move on to David White, who has his hand up. One more question. What's the status of the Woods Restoration Plan? It's yeah, what it, that's right. That did come up. Um, David Morgan and I were trying to remember. We had comments on it, and I think Beals and Thomas was going to pursue, going to look into that. But thanks for the reminder. I've got to check with them on that. Yes, it's good to hear that the letters went out because I didn't even know that. So thank you, Nathaniel, for your efforts. Mm -hmm. Sure. I try to find my notes quickly, but oops. anyways, yeah, sorry, I won't have a, unless David Morgan remembers offhand where we are on the plan. I think we had sent comments and the comments had not been addressed yet. It's my vague recollection about where things. Yeah, I think it's like a year ago, Nathaniel. Almost. Yeah. I want to say it's October of last year. Right. I remember the same. I think that we more or less set the planting plan issue aside to deal with the encroachments and we need to get back to that topic. Sounds like we'll have some updates in the future on this based on what David said about uh, taking on a CR that's not in compliance. So um, unless there's any other things concrete, we should move on because it's, that sounds like a very large discussion um, and we're only giving an update here at this point. Does everyone agree? Sure. Yep. Okay, so we're on item number two, which is our discussions. And first we're gonna hear from or hear about a proposal for a school to use Meadowbrook Park. The Mulberry Forest School is a license exempt outdoor uh, program that focuses on three to eight children and families with disabilities. And I got that from the letter that they uh, had up on our website. And I'm going to turn it over to David now and uh, give a little more of an update. So um, back to you, David. So uh, Mary is here from the school to talk to us a bit about the program and what they propose to use now park for. Before I turn it over to you, Mary, I want to say that, you know, the proposal is essentially to use Meadowbrook Park as the site for an outdoor school, and they promise to perform stewardship in that space. Uh, as we all know, uh, Meadowbrook is one of our least used conservation areas and one of our least cared for, so I think there's some promise to having folks in there regularly and i think that to that end since we have an existing program for stewardship in the land stewards program uh, we should consider this application essentially under that umbrella the folks that i talked with in legal when we were discussing the sims thing i brought up this issue of allowing uh, conservation land to be put to this purpose and whether or not they had any concerns about liability or what have you. And they pointed to the land stewards program as an existing structure through which we can permit stewardship activities and have the necessary waiver signed and so on. So that seemed to be the best course for us to allow this if I make a proposal amendment. So Sure, David, before you move on or throw that over, did 
So what would be the process? Would we approve um, and then it would have to be approved by the select board or is this uh, just a conservation approval that we're looking at um, here now that you've talked to town council? Just conservation. The idea that they had to put it under the land stewardship program would make it just the commission's call. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. So, um, go ahead if you want to introduce yourself and sort of summarize what the proposal is. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me and, and for that lovely introduction. Uh, so my name is uh, Mary Germano Saba. I am a resident of Medford now, actually grew up in Medford, left for many years. I have a PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in geography. And I started this program called Mulberry Forest School a few years ago. It started as a parent-run co-op, uh, focusing on dis disabled families or and parents who kind of wanted an outdoor space it, in response to the pandemic and wanted to kind of continue that. And and so we run, we've continued to run as a sort of semi-cooperative structure. It's not a commercial entity in any way. Uh, it's really just providing like schooling and a a good structure for children to be able to outdoor education and and also really focused on like just really strongly focused on natural stewardship and thinking about our role in preserving and protecting our environment particularly as we're witnessing so much intense climate change uh, or the beginnings of of the intense i think climate change kind of thinking about like how do we really reframe education and reframe children's and all of our uh, interaction with the with nature or with outdoors um, in a kind of more holistic way starting from when they're really young and so our proposal would be to basically move our school we've been we've been in Stoneham for the last couple of years uh, but we have some families who are closer to the sort of city center and and we'd like to be able to accommodate them and, and have them join us and um, and so right, so our proposal would be to sort of come over to Arlington, and I, it's really interesting to know about this land stewardships program because, of course, that is, you know, first of all, I'll just say our we are very kind of low profile in the sense that the children are taught to respect the na the environment, so sort of to respect nature and to respect plants and all of those things, and all good neighbors. Uh, so, you know, in the site where we've been, we have a lot of regulars who we kind of, we see every day and we have good relationships with them. And, and so I know that in some kind of outdoor programs or time, sometimes at camps, kids, people might have this fear that children can be very kind of rowdy and, um, you know, run around and, and attack animals and plants. And that's just really not the, uh, it's just really not the sort of ethos of our of how we function at all. Uh, so that's the second part. And we do ourselves, we, we we would sort of within our liability policy kind of make it that the uh, that the site, you know, wasn't at all liable for anything that with it um, kind of within our, our entity. And what's the other thing I should say also that uh, it's very exciting uh, because, of course, if there are any kind of conservation activities that that the board would be engaged in, we would love actually to collaborate and to see how our program might serve those goals in terms of, I, I you know, I don't know. I mean, one thing I can think of that, that Audubon has done a really nice job of is sort of having little boxes by the road that are empty that people can put things in or, or just some kinds of things like that that... Um, you know, our educators, one of them is is an artist, a practicing artist. This is the a second one is a local chef and also has a great deal of experience with woodworking. And, and she's an herbalist as well. They both have a background in early childhood. And I think that that's, and the, the final thing I'll say is that, you know, we're sort of eventually hoping to develop a relationship with the public schools to make this kind of program and our programming more accessible to to more people. That's my introduction. Yeah, I would love to hear any other things. Sure, thank you. That was that's really nice. Um, David, you had your hand up. Mm 
Meadowbrook Park has been a sort of a problem area for decades. There's a lot of trash, a lot of things washed down Millbrook, even things like syringes and so on. So it's a real problem site. Also, is on massive invasive growths. So I'm just, are you, what are you planning to do with those conditions? I'm just wondering how you can work around all that. So, you know, one of the things that my children actually really like to do is pick up trash. I mean, syringes, I think maybe we would, really, but they go to places. We I took them to a pool today and they started pulling the leaves out of the bottom anyway. Um, so, you know, and also invasive plant growth, like I said, uh, uh, Sarah Carlisle, who was the lead teacher, was a community garden coordinator for a number of years, and, and she is just really familiar with local plants. So, for example, actually, we have been pulling out some invasive species in our um, adventures in Whip Hill, where we have been based. And um, yeah, so I guess that, that that's my answer is that, you know, if there we would survey the environment, I mean, we're very kind of uh, careful and and know not to go to places where there's poison ivy and all that, but and you have trash, but you get arranged for DPW to take it away as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, like we would happy to be sort of figure helping to figure that out too if that was something useful. Sure, let's move on to uh, Brian McBride. Oh yeah, so uh, in general, I I really support this kind of education. I'm a big fan of Richard Louvre and the Last Child in the Woods and all the movement of getting people kids back to nature. Um, but I do have some, despite that, I have a little concern, just this is a very small uh, area and it's relatively delicate, I think, in terms of it's a wetland, you know, and uh, ducks and um, cattails and so forth. So I'm just a little worried about, you know, if there were a dozen kids uh, live next to a school and, you know, they can be destructive, right? They can start to build fairy houses and off come branches and, you know, things get uh, torn up. Um, how, how could we be assured that there would not be, uh, that this would be, you know, leave only footprints or take only pictures or whatever, that you, people wouldn't know to know that there was a, a classroom at, a, in this site. And maybe you can give me a little bit of assurance about how many kids would be there, how many days a week, and to, to address the concern about overuse and potential damage. So thank you, yeah, for that question. And I, you know, I also, share that concern and 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 this is why as i sort of led with the ethos that we really do teach the children is the leave no trace and i know that this sounds uh, maybe uh, uh, i don't know unbelievable in some way but it's really like a you teach them young and then they start to learn how to do that so that's sort of like the really thing i should emphasize um how could you be assured I, it's it's the it's just how how we function. I mean, I sometimes I think we would be we're sort of mobile, so we would be kind of moving around that kind of whole area a little bit, and then you know sometimes they'll kind of go if there's a concrete area and they'll do some chalk on the street or something like that. But um, and then other... like how many how many kids? How many hours? How many? So days right now we are five days a week. We've been three hours. We'd like to extend a couple hours, probably to five hours a day. And we have not been more than ten children. And and again, like we have a really low child to teacher ratio, which is you know five to one, basically, and which is a lot kind of more than um, more adults than regular school programs often are um be in that site uh every day every each of the five days so like 12 13 people on the site five days a week three five hours a day yeah i think so but i don't but i guess that on the site i mean it wouldn't be necessarily that we would just be kind of there kind of congregating um pull, pulling up you know, whatever, just sort of being in one area, if someone would worry about like grass or something. Um, but, but again, like they, the children are pretty mobile and I'll say, you know, we've had, you know, the place that we've been in, we've had a very good relationship with, and it's a beautiful kind of magical, wonderful forest over there at the edge of the fells, but it's really just like a little bit too remote for some folks. Mary, have you gone to Meadowbrook and 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 taking a look at it and understand for and at least in your own mind that it works for your purposes. 
Yeah, I have taken a look. I mean, we didn't kind of go yet with the children. I was waiting to come and speak with the with you guys before I kind of told them, oh, this might be a new location, and then they would get excited. So okay, I just wanted to make sure you put your eyes on it. Yeah, um, yeah, I've been there before I proposed. That was I proposed it because we've sort of been there, but it is connected to some other areas. I think that that's the other thing is that like we don't just sort of stay in one place. We're very mobile, and there's a lot of kind of like walking and singing between, um, you know, different learning activities that happen. Sure, Nathaniel Stevens, can you uh, unmute? Thanks. Actually, I think David and Susan were ahead of me, so I'll defer to them. Thanks. All right, I'm going to pick one person, and I don't want you to give it away. Or so let's go with Susan. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I was, I was just wondering how old the children are or, or they, is there a range? Um, and then I had a, a follow-up question. Yeah, they're between three and right now nine, I guess is the oldest. Okay. And, um, have you explored any, I, I love this idea. I'm just not a hundred percent sure Meadowbrook Park is the right location. It floods. Um, you know, there's going to be times you just can't even get in there. Um, so have you looked at any other locations in Arlington? So for example, Turkey Hill is a nice wooded secluded area. It has hills. It has some little perched wetland that gets wet in the spring. You know, it has an area where there's some rocks. It has a water tower. You know, you could talk about, you know, where does water come from? So uh, I'm not saying you should choose that, but I, I'm just a little mm -hmm. hesitant about Meadowbrook Park because I'm not sure it's the right location for you. But I love the idea. Sure. Let's just move on to yep. David Morgan. I'm just trying to, it, it, so, it sounds like there may not be enough time to fully discuss this tonight uh, on our discussion items. But David, uh, please ask your question. I am thinking about the abutting property to Meadowbrook Park, which is a cemetery, and that's a different set of folks who have authority in that setting. So I was trying to imagine a pickup and drop off situation, you know, that wouldn't interfere with cemetery operations or, you know, make folks feel uncomfortable about the fact of being in a cemetery. Um, mm which could pose problems down the line. So I just want to flag it for consideration. I do think otherwise this is a great proposal. And I, I hear what Susan's saying as well about Meadowbrook being problematic for sort of seasonal weather issues and so on and so forth. Maybe Cooks Hollow, which is just up river of Meadowbrook and across the street could be pretty suitable for um, this purpose instead that is on Mystic Street is easy, you know, pick up drop off situation, um, plenty of space. It's a great site. I'm going to be making improvements to it. Uh, venture this or really um, goes well. Just a suggestion. Sure. Uh, David Kaplan. I'm going to defer to Nathaniel. He's Go ahead, Nathaniel. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, David. Uh, to a uh, question and comment, Mary, are you looking for a sort of exclusive use of the Meadowbrook Park or the other area? You're, you can run your program with other people running through and participate. Okay, using using the property, that's great. Also, is this a year-round program? I'm just wondering when winter comes or when the cold weather comes, um, you'll be out there yeah all your all your round all weather i mean the, mm -hmm. the old, yeah sorry did i cut you off no no i was gonna say yeah i was thinking snow and cold but also susan's concern too about meadowbrook park sometimes it's just very very flooded and you have, you have limited room on that but um i was going to suggest to the board that one option we might do is a, a trial period uh sort of a, a month i don't know maybe uh, maybe give you know give permission for a month um and see, you know, Mary may find out that it's not what she wants, <laughs> it's not what she envisioned, but something like that, and just see what what issues come up. Because uh, I am very supportive of the of the concept. 
And just a comment to David Morgan, I think if it's under the stewardship program, they may need to sign waivers, maybe, for the town. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, let's see. I think I'm just going to go to Brian. I, do you have something pressing yeah, there, David? Super quick. Um, she might also consider rotating between different parks. My my concern is kind of overuse of a really small space, and maybe that would be remedied by rotating from Turkey Hill to monotony to this this site and that might be less impactful and maybe more fun for the kids too hmm. david morgan yeah just um quickly tying on to brian's thought some of those properties are under park and rec commission authority whereas um cooks hollow and meadowbrook are conservation commission Malcavoa too and not for I say you might consider those three if you're just you know in keeping with the conservation and window on the mystic. Window on the mystic. It's true. Um, That's a great location. So you can watch the herring runs. So what, what I heard was um not an isolated spot like the fells. So I don't think window in the mystic and Turkey Hill is exactly what Mary's asking for, but I don't really know what to do with this. It sounds like we have a lot of questions. Maybe um, I was going to ask Mary, when do you need a decision by, and should we approach this by asking you to give a presentation at the next meeting where we could hear um, uh, from hear more from you and about uh, how the operation works? Because it, in my mind, I've been to Meadowbrook uh, a few times and um, it looks like you just kind of go through the fence, you drop in, it's kind of a floodplain with an overgrown uh, Japanese knotweed um, stands all through it and you're, it's almost like a maze. There may be other parts of it that I don't know about, um, but it's it's something that maybe those three that David offered, you could look at and then could come back to our next meeting. So when do you need the decision? I guess that's the most important question out of what I've asked. Yeah, thanks for all of these questions and also suggestions could be really cool actually to rotate between different conservation sites. Um, to be totally honest with you, the sooner the better because, because there's, we sort of have to tell, be able to tell people whether we could we are actually able to move Arlington or not. And and so so that they can make decisions about what they're going to do in September. And so I'm not sure when the I think the next meeting is like in September 5th, maybe. Yes, yeah. September 5th, yeah. Yeah, I checked so, it out. So if it was possible to sort of do a preliminary vote on allowing us to come and perhaps do, you know, like a trial period of three months or something and then work out the details of, I mean, you know, I, I do like Meadowbrook because it's sort of centrally located and I like the location, the sort of, I personally as an artist actually I'm doing a project on the Mystic River watershed. I have, I wear many hats. <laughs> um, and so I, you know, sort of like that proximity, but it's not a, you know, absolute 100% necessity on our part. We could, we're happy to be sort of continue discussion if this was possible, like with David about coordinate coordinating sort of separately if the if the commission would kind of give us a ten tentative approval or something like that. I would I would be willing to do a three month approval with coordination with David Morgan on appropriate conservation managed properties that you could choose from. Um, and I think you'll find maybe Meadowbrook may not be the one you end up with all the time. Um, but I hear what David's saying that it would be better if it stays in conservation because otherwise you have to go to park and rec and sometimes they charge <laughs> for use. It's yeah, so it's it's a different model. Um, but I, I and I think I've heard from most of the commissioners, Chuck, that were supportive of the program, um, given the parameters, which is hesitant about the, the sites. So I would feel comfortable giving three month permission with communication with David Morgan about appropriate sites. I, I would second that too. I'm not sure what more Mary could, uh, could present, pre pre present yeah. at, a, at another yeah. at another meeting. So yeah. I think it's. 
Sounds good. I, I, I second. Susan's so I think we question. have a first and a second. My only question in between the first and second is the entrance seems to be through the cemetery. Is this cemetery committee need to be uh, updated on this plan? David. That was the other question I was going to ask earlier is, is there another entrance exit through the neighborhood on the other side? Uh, Meadowbrook Park, you well, you can access it off the street by the uh, the by the quote unquote dam there before it goes under. What's the name of the kind of blanking Mystic, Mystic Parkway? There, that's not so good. Mystic Parkway. No, it's not so you can get in that way because we actually we did have a scatter. There is an upland area there, uh, sort of parallel to the road, and there's a big pipe that we had a scout. David White will remember we had a scout who built a path through that through that upland area. There's, so a sewer pipe along there. Sewer pipe along that that stretch. It's not the best access to stop at given the high speed of traffic, but it, it is accessible. It's not a good place to stop. No. Yeah. Well, I, we could add conditioned on an approved access plan. Right, and the condition that they have to work with David on which part, which conservation lands are appropriate for this activity. We're giving him that authority. So it wouldn't be appropriate if you can't find an access. That's Yeah, and I, th I think that's really, yeah, I, I don't think we need to, I think Mar Mary's concern about access, I think is going to be heightened more than, than ours, frankly, because she has the liability of the kids. So I don't, I think we just, the maybe we just say, you know, use these sites, but choose, have a safe, have a safe access and egress plan. I think that's really all we can, it's appropriate for us to say. I think along David Moore, uh, David uh, Kaplan's lines, uh, thoughts. Yeah, I would be happy to ask for the cemetery commission about access to the cemetery in this case. For, for I think that would be a good idea. Yeah, I think that politically, that's just a good idea. Mm -hmm. Well, if they're each morning, cars are dropping. Uh, people off and they're congregating in that area, it's yeah. going to be noticed. So, all right. So uh, there's a motion on the floor. I believe it is out of three sites that David mentioned, we would like uh, a three month um, window for uh, this program, but it has to be appropriate and it has to have, um, is that what it is? It has to have a uh, access that's acceptable um, and appropriate. And then I guess David is going to make that decision. Mike, so Mike Gildas game. Yeah, I just wondered uh, when would that three months start? September? As soon as Mary would like it to start. Okay. Just think that it's useful to have that information. Good idea. So uh, Susan, you made the motion. Do you want to set a date? Today's date, September 1st? Um, Mary, would that be acceptable to you? Or would you like it later? So, so probably like... I mean, usually programs start after September late. September 1st. September. Oh, right. Okay. So today is the second. So September 3rd. September 3rd. Okay. Right after Labor Day. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay. I'll second that amendment to the motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we're just going to have one straight vote here. And uh, we're going to go with uh, Mike Gillis game. Yes, indeed. And David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. Thank you. Keep in touch with David. Thanks everybody for also the very thoughtful questions. And thank thanks. You. Yeah. Good luck. Good we'd luck. like to we'd like to hear back about the pro program. So maybe after the three months or before the three months are going to expire, you could come back. Yeah. Maybe a little report to us. Yeah. Definitely. I take lots of pictures since I'm a visual artist. So. Great. Do that. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you. Much more. Okay. Moving on, we have a vote uh, to appropriate $75 for a booth at Town Day. Can I have a motion? So moved. I have a second. I'll second it. Nathaniel Stevens. Uh, just discussion. Do we are people who are voting committing to sit at the at the town day booth? I think that's a separate discussion. <laughs> where a the, separate the, the application, but it's already, always an issue. Otherwise, <laughs> it's it's always an issue. I don't think I'm in town that weekend. <laughs> so, we, I just don't want to pay for a booth that no one's going to be manning. There'll be somebody okay. there. Yeah. Okay, I'll second it. I'll, I'll vote for it. Okay, great. Uh, so Susan Chapnick. Be there. Yes. <laughs> David David White. Yes. 
David Kaplan? Yes. Mike Gill, this game? Yes. Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay, we got our $75. Now, David, I guess from Nathaniel's direction, we should put on the agenda, upcoming agenda, who's going to volunteer for this day on uh, September 21st, 2024, for a town day. Moving on, five Mystic Drive Certificate of Compliance. That applicant has withdrawn that request, so we are just going to leave that where it is. It's withdrawn, and we're going to have uh, move on to um, D, which is the Water Bodies Working Group. David White, a discussion about uh, the Spy Pond Coring Project. A couple of things, actually. Beside that, um, first item is that the. Um... Not on the, just have that the reservoir is not done for the season. The reservoir is looking very good after all the efforts, including a lot of volunteer efforts managed by the Mystic River Association. I also mentioned that we are sort of stuck on the spy pond phragmites treatment because you can't agree on the herbicide to use. This order of condition does not allow um, glyphosate, which is recommended by the contractor. So that is sort of in limbo at the moment. To bring that to your attention. What's the resolution then? I saw some emails about getting an expert to talk to us about glyphosate from Dave Kaplan, I think. Where does that stand? Well, we, we need to, and it needs to happen before the frost. So we get Does the Water Bodies Working Group have a recommendation? They would, they would uh, no, recommend the, to the, to the to conservation commission. Basically, we want to get it done. And yeah, some well, I get it. Yeah, opinions about the um, herbicides, and Brad thinks we should not do it at all unless we can use the recommended herbicide, which is glyphosate. Yeah, but I'm not asking not for a recommendation right now. I'm asking yeah. that yeah. you guys have heard all the discussions. You've understood what's going to work, what's not going to work. We're trying to move forward. We're going to lose our window. You know. We've not what, had what what other communities do, that kind of stuff. I don't think I could speak for the whole group to say we have come to any sort of recommendation at this point. I think that would be uh, a good path forward if uh, we needed to rethink about glyphosate. If maybe not, it, and if you said, "Look, absolutely no glyphosate," then that would be nice to know also. I th I don't there's think a, there's a clear understanding among consensus among the committee as what we should do. Dave Kaplan, I tried to bring it to a, a, oh, discussion, sorry. but I think we're in sort of a limbo state right now. I think it's up to the I think the commission needs to decide whether we can modify the order condition for glyphosate or not. I mean, it's a larger issue and beyond what the water bodies commission group, water group, group can deal with. Well, so the, what I'm trying to say is if the Water Bodies Working Group came back with a with a recommendation that we have to use glyphosate, that would help us modify the order of conditions. So if you guys are undecided, just think the commission might be undecided also. Chuck, I'd like to hear from Dave Kaplan. If yeah, I, I yeah. get it. I get okay. it. Okay, thanks. All right. Um, Dave Kaplan. Thank you. So I'm in touch with a uh, representative of, or um, I guess uh, a, a PhD at um, Mass Department of Agriculture and MDAR. And I've heard talks that he's given about glyphosate, you know, in conjunction with a um, UMass professor, I'm blocking whose name I'm blocking on, but he has agreed to give a presentation to the commission at a future date if uh, to talk about you know the science around glyphosate and you know how it's used and you know what the what the state's current take on it is um, i think it would be helpful to have that information as we consider it or potentially consider it for a fragmites management so i think they, he would be happy to present at a future meeting and we can work offline to figure out when that best meeting could be, what would work with a schedule. And I would propose that if we need to make a decision whether we have to do something this year and change the permit, 
if we can fit this in in the next meeting or two, we should. So my, my sense from the meetings is that Bragmites at this point hasn't taken over and that it can wait another season. I think yeah, there seems so. to be pressure to use the money that we have this season, but um, but we're, we're getting that from the contractor that using a Mazamox by itself wouldn't be effective. So I'd rather not introduce another chemical into the system that's not going to be effective. And we're just going to have to go back and reapply the following year. So my recommendation, not necessarily the Water Bodies Working Group recommendation is to um, consider glyphosate as a commission and make that decision as soon as we have additional information. Even if that means foregoing doing any treatment this year? Correct. Okay. Unless we change order condition, of course, you probably can't. I would say that I second Dave's recommendation. I've been under the impression that we would take that course of action um, and likely postpone the treatment until the next season. Uh, for the last several weeks. And so uh, uh, I of just as my operating assumption that we're, we're going to take the time of the winter to hear about glyphosate, revise the NOI if appropriate, and then you know get together a contract for the start of the growing season in 2025. So um Again, not speaking for the whole our bodies working group, but as the agent just out there my two cents. Yeah, it's not urgent this season, so we might as well take our time and do it next time, next year. Sounds good to me. I also like David's idea of having the PhD who he spoke with to come come to the commission yes. to discuss that. Could be helpful for, for this instance and our other projects yes. where glyphosate. Like let's say is pr proposed. Definitely. Because I'm thinking of the Metro Boat Club, which we have later today. So yeah. But it does sound like it's going to be further than the next two meetings because this is a next year uh application. So it Benjamin Boat Club is gonna miss miss out on the information. So well that's we what can I'm hearing. the Metro Boat Club. Right, you're right. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. All right, Mike, kill this game. Yes, I was just going to suggest that uh, David uh, talk with uh, uh, David Morgan uh, about a time when it would fit in on, on the agenda to have that person come and give that presentation. So we can move forward. Yeah, uh, make sure I'm involved, but uh, that sounds like a good idea. All right. Yeah, I think... Uh, you know, that's a good plan. I would like to see a little more information come into the commission about glyphosate. It looks like uh, David Kaplan has someone who's willing to talk to the commission. Let's see if we can get that uh, on the agenda, upcoming one of the upcoming meetings. All right, if that's Can okay. Can update, Jack? Sure. The corn study is a proposal from um, a couple of academics, paleoclimatologists who are interested, and the Arlington Historical Society, who are interested in the sediments in Spy Pond. And you all may be familiar with the um, tusk that was pulled out of Spy Pond by someone who was fishing, and that was a mammoth or a mastodon. <laughs> I forget which one, whichever one they thought it was, it was the other one. So they have this sort of longstanding interest in determining uh, more historical facts about um, Spy Pond and you know the climate at the time of um, you know when that animal died and so on and so forth. So they have a proposal for administrative approval to do to take samples of the sediment. Uh, they're roughly 10 inches around, I believe, and six feet deep, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, cores that would be lower down from 
canoes that are designed to deploy this kind of um, instrument and raise back up to the samples home, analyze them, et cetera. So um, they haven't filed the administrative approval process yet, but I expect it to come in soon and um, for work to begin thereafter. What does the, uh, I see the, David White has his hand up. So David, please. I saw something about 40 feet in the emails. Is it 40? Yeah, 40. I'm second guessing myself when I said six. Quite long. If they're going to take cores, they should try to do as many things that they can at the same time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm going to look at the email now and double check. Uh, David, could you let me know how the cores are taken? They go out there on a flat bottom boat and drive, you know, like give me a good detail of how this happens. As you mentioned, there's two boats tied together on some <laughs> sort of raft, but anyway. Yeah, it's a, they call it a catamaran style coring raft with a wooden platform attached to two canoes or pontoons. Um, they drop three or four anchors, keep the raft in place, and they would drop these cores down and um, take the samples. And it was a moment, by the way. Um, let me see. I was asking about, we were looking for information about the depth of the core. There's 40 feet of peat at the bottom of Spy Pond from the original bottom left by glaciers. I'm not sure that they're coring all the way down. It is, it's not clear. No, it says uh, we collect sediments using a Livingstone sampler, which is uh, one meter in length. So I'm even shorter than I suggested. OK. All right. Uh, any other comments? about the coring. If not, we're gonna move on to the tree committee update from Brian McBride. Yeah, just a, just a quick update. So there, uh, the committee is continuing to do work on the tree preservation program. Um, they do have a, I, I'd be interested in following up. That they do have a list of trees at risk and I'd, I'd like to take a look at that myself. Um, the tree canopy program uh, continues on. They're focusing on uh, back a sidewalk pilot where trees are provided to homeowners near near sidewalks to enhance the tree canopy. And they are facing a few challenges in locating a contractor, but they expect that to be ramping up in, in the fall or the spring, moving out of a pilot program to a full-scale program. Um, adopt a tree program continues. Uh, trees have been adopted. They're looking to, again, promote this uh, more broadly. They have some posters to do that. And uh, as Susan, actually, I think Susan Sams might be on, but I do believe at the end of the meeting, they noticed that they would be attending Town Day and the uh, September Environmental Summit as well. And Susan can uh, correct me if I got that wrong, but that's what I got, John. All right, great. Uh, moving on, I see Susan's not commenting, so I'm going to move on quickly to CPA update. Brian McBride again. Yeah, no news. <laughs> nothing Nothing new has happened there. Okay, so uh, Park and Recreation, Susan Chapman will update us on the August 13th, 2024 meeting and let us know when the next Park and Recreation Committee meeting is. And that is the one, unless Susan wants to go for some reason, like a follow up on what she was there for on the 13th, then that's the one I'll go to. So Susan, can you update us on that meeting? Sure. I'm going to first I'm going to talk about schedule. So they decided to go back to their schedule where the first meeting of their month, which is the second Tuesday of the month, and that's going to be September 10th is their next meeting. And that's going to be um, just talking about um, capital and administrative. And then the the fourth Tuesday of every month is going to have other um, issues discussed. So, and then that's 824. So whoever goes to the next meeting, if it's you, Chuck, I would check the agenda when it's posted and see if they keep up with this. 
because mm -hmm. we should only then have a liaison to one of their meetings a month because having a liaison to an update on their capital and administrative things is is not productive i don't think i so. was going to say i mean maybe i shouldn't go to the one that's capital uh, yeah no i don't think so so that's what i'm saying i think that's that might be the uh, the 10th but you should check the following the, when they post yeah. it okay i was i was just going to maybe disagree with that because if they're talking about capital projects i think that's the opportunity for us to say hey you know when you're planning this project remember you're gonna have to plan some money for oh, well that's a good point. Yeah, that projects, point yeah or especially if it's administrative like oh we have a complaint that's a good point uh, dogs in hills pond right you know let's do right. something let's let let's let them you know swim all the way across the pond or something like that right we'll go right. up in the woods so right. i i I would be reluctant to just okay. uh, not go to a meeting. Okay. Then we'll keep rotating. With all due respect to Leslie Meyer, who I see who's here, but I think, <laughs> yeah, if we're, again, if we're trying to keep the communications sure. open, we should sure. go to all the meetings. Yeah. Sure. Sure. I think yeah. that's perfectly fair and, and absolutely true, Nathaniel. Thanks, okay. Leslie. <laughs> all right. Okay. So sounds... just, just a quick update on the things that affect the commission. I'm not going to tell you everything Park and Rec talked about. They had a very full meeting. It went till 10 p.m., which is unusual for them. Um, there's some discussion about monotomy, um, which I'm not going to go through because monotomy is being heard tonight. So, so we'll get up, we'll get to that. Um, there is uh, they they are hiring a new director and an assistant director. I think that's important for us to just know. Um, for communication, the, the positions are going to be closed um, the end of the summer, and hopefully they'll have somebody, you know, chosen and vetted and everything by, you know, sometime in the fall. Um, and um, they, they discussed several uh, communications that came in to the commission. Um, including the one that I sent in about port, the heat of port in place surfaces. And then there was some discussion um, from some members of the commission um, on the 21 Pond Lane open space visioning, um, uh, visioning session, which I was unable to go to, so I didn't go there. Um, so there was, there was some discussion about that. Um, I know that's very early in its um, visioning um, but they were concerned because apparently some residents have contacted some members of Park and Rec and thought it was a Park and Rec project. So it seems to be some miscommunication to the public about this project, you know, this visioning. Um, so I'm, I'm sure Park and Rec would appreciate it. If we could, if not we, David Morgan could clarify that at, at some point when when he's available to do so. And I don't think there was anything else that really um it really oh the only other thing is there's going to be a 5k run around the arlington reservoir for charity um just as an fyi um that um the park and rec um approved but it'll be on the path so so chuck you're going to the next meeting uh, yes. Okay. Yes, I'm going to the next meeting. Okay. What date is the run? The run? Uh, Sunday, November 3rd. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll Did I miss number. anything, Leslie, that, that I should update people on? Um, I don't think so. I mean, we did schedule a meeting to talk about capital. Right. Off. Um, off the schedule, off right. The Another schedule meeting. Because right capital plans are due at the end of the month. Right. And was that the 27th? I think it was this extra meeting on the 27th and it's Zoom, right? Yes. Okay. Oh, I see Natasha's there and she's shaking her head. Okay. Yeah. So that might be one you might want to attend, Chuck. I don't know. Natasha. Yeah, your hand up too. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just going to add, I just wanted to clarify. So the director position has been posted and that will close on the 27th of this month, the assistant director position. Um, that's a little bit down the pipeline. We're going to hire the director first and then um, an assistant director position will come later on. So that might be 
um, <clears throat> you know, a month, couple months down the road after the, the director has been hired. The other confusing part was that we're hiring a supervisor of um, programs and that one is closing on the 27th or the 26th. Okay. So the assistant director is coming down the road, but just to clarify, so no one thinks it's, you know. Oh, but thank you for that. There are two, yeah, there are yeah. two positions out there. Just Great. the assistant director we're holding off on just for a little bit. Great. Yeah, yeah. Wanna... I mean, because we're losing our program person who is going into the fire department. So Joe is gone and Matt Curran is leaving or has left. He's this week and end, end of the summer. So, yes. yeah. Thank there's, you. There's quite a bit of changeover happening. Seems in like it. Recreation. Seems like it. Brian? Yeah, just question is one of those a new position? Is the assistant director a new position? And if so, have we defined what the responsibilities are? Is that something? Oh, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This I is not a recreation Natasha meeting. Can, can we just get back to our agenda? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. seriously, <laughs> guys. Natasha, Natasha's very available, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. let's move on. But that's my update. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. Okay. All right. All right. Finished. Uh, finished that. Number three on our agenda is the hearing. Thorndike Place, uh, DEP file number 910356. This is a continuation of the August 1st uh, conservation meeting, which was continued because we we're still waiting for the CZA third party review response to arrive. The commission and the applicant have received um, that response. I believe they received it on August 1st, a document from CZA. And um, you can find that on the Thorndike page or reach out to David Morgan, the conservation office. The applicant for Thorndike Places informed the commission that after receiving the information, they are preparing their response. Um, this is all to say that we'll be not discuss we will not discuss Thorndike Place tonight and we'll be discussing it at our next meeting, which is September 5th, 2024. The applicant sent an, an email on August 8th, uh, 2024, uh, requesting a continuance to the September 5th, 2024 conservation meeting. And with that, can I get a motion to continue Thorndike Place DEP file number 910356 to September 5th, 2024? So moved. And a second. Second. Second, David Kaplan. Mike Gildas game. I'm recused myself again. Yep. Mike Gildas game. I thought it was David, but that's all right. Mike says yes. Susan Chapnick. Yeah, we we didn't you didn't ask for discussion, which sometimes I don't want any discussion when we're continuing uh that's a fine. meeting. I, I understand. I just want to tell the public that the peer review has been posted from GCA. That's, That's what I said when my statement. Oh, did you? I missed that. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So we're moving on. We have a first. We have a second. Mike is voted. Susan yeah. Chapnick. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. So that's been continued to September 2nd, September 5th, 2024. I'm going to move on to the Medford Boat Club. Okay. This is a continuation of the August 1st, 2024 Conservation Commission meeting. The Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing under the Wetlands Protection Act and the Arlington Wetland Protection Bylaw to consider a notice of intent for aquatic management program at the Medford Boat Club located on Mystic Lake at our June 20th conservation meeting, which was the last meeting that we discussed this project, there was a request from our commissioner, David Kaplan, uh, that Solitude provide information in table form that included a minimum target uh, aquatic invasive species herbicide to control these target species, time of year for the application of herbicide, uh, the amount of herbicide to be used. Uh, the commission has asked Solitude uh, if the Division of Marine and Fisheries, if they've responded to their letter, if they received their letter, and if they have responded to their letter. And that is also up on our website. I believe that Tana Poole is here from Solitude Lake Management. Tana, can you introduce yourself for the record and bring us up to date on your project for the aquatic management at uh, Medford Boat Club? Tana, do you have? Yep, sure. I see that you just turned off, you turned on your microphone. Uh, man, how, how are you guys doing tonight? Um, my name is Tanner Poole. 
school, I'm a social project manager at Sao Paulo Lake Management. Um, I know we've had a couple of uh, kind of uh, musical chairs as far as uh, managers coming in to step in for this project, but I'm back again. Um, what I remember, you guys asked about uh, kind of the table uh, regarding the herbicides and when they would be used as far as the time of year. Like you said, I believe we submitted that. Um, we also, you guys also had some questions regarding um, kind of like our last site visit and what exactly we were targeting. And I believe Keith uh, sent you guys an email, at least, I believe had at least like three answers on it regarding um, our proposed yeah. monitoring plan. And Tanner, is, uh, we're getting a garbled, uh, your voice is a little bit garbled. I don't know if you can improve that a bit. Oh. Can you hear me better now? Oh, absolutely. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so you, yeah, pretty much we he sent a response, um, pretty much stating the DMF's kind of uh, recommended guidelines for how we should follow, and then pretty much explained our slight deviations to that. And did you guys get that email? Can seeing see. everyone saying no no sorry I, I can't find any materials on the google drive for this project david morgan help me out sorry to yeah the problem up. is and and we you know i'll reiterate when we have continued hearings we need to have all the materials from the previous hearing for thorndike it's easy because it's on the web page but we're going to have to start reposting those because it's very hard for continued hearings to find all the materials. Right. That said, it's a it's a letter, I think it was from June 18th, 2024. It was an email from June 18th, 2024. I don't know if that's helpful, Nathaniel. I don't know if it went to the entire commission though. Okay, but it's not on the it's not in the Google Drive, right? It was sent by email. No. I'm sorry. It's not on the current Google Drive. Okay. This meeting. Unfortunately. Okay. So it's from David Morgan. All right. Yeah. I'll look at my email. Thanks. Um, Sorry. Yeah, see, if, see if you can but, find it. I, I might be able to find it um, myself. So maybe David Morgan can find yeah. it and put it up. Yeah. Okay. That Sorry. Would be yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I guess continue <laughs> whoever's presenting. Yeah. Tanner, can you continue? Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, I can just run down the email in a sense. Um, if that helps at all. Um, so yeah. pretty much we hadn't conducted a site visit in this year since the program wasn't active and the OC expired in 2020. So our last inspection of Medford Boat Club was in the summer, in the late summer of 23, when we were filing for the NOI. And at the time we went and surveyed and we only found Eurasian water milfoil, curly leaf pondweed. Eurasian water milfoil was found in a higher abundant between the two, but we also assumed this was the case because of the time of the survey with the early senescence of curly leaf pondweed as well. Um, the Eurasian water milfoil was only found in sparse to moderate uh, patches and had a very a rare a varying size and density. Excuse me. Um, and as far as the DMF guidelines and hard our plans deviate slightly from them. I'll state the DMF guideline first, and then I'll state what we were following up with. So for the sampling sites, DMF required us to or recommended at least three different sampling stations in pond or slash treatment areas that were less than 50 acres total. Our plan included four different sampling sites. And since Medford Boat Club is split into an upper section and a lower section, we planned it, we planned to do a control section on each side and then a treatment section in each side. And we would sample all four of those sites since it wouldn't make sense to do three sampling sites and one site wouldn't have a control group. So we upped it to four just so each side would have a control side and each side would have a treatment area where we would actually have the herbicide there for a reason. Um, the guidelines for two, so herbicide residues, the guideline recommended sampling of herbicide residues at each sampling station. 
Our proposed plan does not include any herbicide residue sampling given the small size of the designated management zones, which are smaller than, I believe, two acres, or at least an acre on each side. Um, the nature of the program would be for the plant uptake and the dilution of the herbicide to be, or excuse me, the uptake of the herbicide to be pretty rapid. As a result, the herbicide concentrations would be transient and therefore not a significant toxicity risk to diagemous fish. And then for the third uh, recommendation is the guidelines recommend that we have a 48 hour and a 24 hour pre-treatment monitoring round. But our plan only incorporated a single immediately prior monitoring event. And this would be consistent with the prior DMF uh, monitoring requirement that we had back in 2020. And it would provide information to establish a baseline for our readings pre-treatment and then how to evaluate what those look like after post-treatment. And that's pretty much the gist of the email he sent back as far as the DMF recommendations. Okay. Um, I don't know if any commissioners have some questions. If, if Tanner, if you've finished your update to the Conservation Commission. I'm looking for, I'm looking for hands. Sure, let's start with Susan. Um, thanks, Tanner. Um, so I, I have a few questions. Um, I appreciate the response. Um, I, I agree that the two sites on each side are necessary. Um, and I appreciate you, you doing that. Um, I, I think it sounds reasonable um, to to do the um, the monitoring the way you're saying it. I would add that it's important to do the observation monitoring of the herring, um, which wasn't listed. I didn't see that anywhere in your monitoring, though you did report that in one of your reports previously. Um, I I think that. Um, I'm still concerned about the herbicides requested to be used. Uh, I went back and read the reports from 2018, 2019, and 2020. I went over them with Dave Kaplan on the side too. And it was only in 2018 that glyphosate was needed to control water milfoil. And it looks to me like it's because you treated so late in the year and didn't get to treat earlier. And that was the timing of the permit. Um, both in 2019 and 2020, that wasn't needed because you treated earlier with the diquat and then the copper algicide. And the um, it looked like that, that kind of controlled things enough that you didn't need to use the glyphosate later on. Um, as you, if you've been on the call, you know that the commission is, is, um, is considering, you know, the science around using glyphosate and concerned about its use. We have not approved glyphosate use for aquatic management in a number of years in this commission um, because of our concerns. That might change with information we might receive from the science, um, but we don't have that yet. So I, for one, I'm, I'm not in favor of approving glyphosate for this small area, especially since it looks like you may not need it if you treat you know, appropriately um, you know, during the year. Um, I will say that things like water lilies, you, you can hand pull. Right. Um, yeah, it's not a great, you know, it's not fun, but if you get them early enough, you know, like I, I assume you can hand pull them like water chestnuts. Um, so that may be an appropriate, you know, alternate. And if you have the die quad early enough, that's going to knock things down. So, so though that's my two cents there. I have some other um, recommendations for conditions about reporting and, and timing, but I can defer to to somebody else who wants to talk now. We can talk about that if we talk about conditions. Oh. Tanner, other... does that sound reasonable if we no, don't that... approve glyphosate of say to do hand pulling? That is completely reasonable with me. Okay, thank you. No problem. 
any other commissioners that have uh, comments? I'll just echo, I support what Susan just said. Okay, uh, I'm going to open this up at this time for uh, anyone attending tonight's hearing that would like to uh, make a comment on the Medford Boat Club Aquatic Management. If they could just uh, turn their video on or and just wave, or you could use the raise hand function and the, rea the reactions button is in the raise hand function and let us know uh, that you'd like to say something about this project. Seeing none, going back to the commission for further comments or motions. I'll make a motion to close the hearing. I'll second. Motion by Susan Chapnick, seconded by Nathaniel Stevens. David Kaplan? Yes. David White? Yes. Mike Gildas Game? Yes. Susan Chapnick? Yes. Nathaniel Stevens? Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. Now, we can discuss some of the conditions uh, for this project. And um, I think, Susan, you said that you had a few to discuss. Yeah. Um, so I, I would recommend we accept their monitoring conditions with the, um, with the, with the, the, response of June 18th, 2024, um, and with the addition of monitoring for the presence of schooling of river her herring um, when they do their monitoring. I propose that they report the current year's data provide to the commission no later than December 1st of each year. I propose a, um, a limit on when they can do the um, herbicide applications that I forgot the dates now. Oh, here it is. Um, no herbicide application between April 1st and June 30th. This is from the um, DMF for the, the herring fish run. Um, uh, let's see, is there anything else I wanted to? Oh, and the, and the only approval of her, the only approved herbicides are diquat and the copper aldicide. Did I miss anything? Dave Kaplan, anybody else? Any other conditions? I think there was another herbicide on the list. It was mm -hmm. the, the Procellicor. And what was that? Right. And I didn't understand the need for that. I think that's for the water shield, which was really. No, that was for the milk. No, oils, that was for the. They, yeah. they said they had. So I would, oh, okay. I'd be okay with that. And the diquat um, could that could also be used for. That's what know, I was thinking. Why do you for... need two Procellicor and diquat? Right. I didn't understand that. Maybe well, Tyler can tell us. Yeah, the Procellicor was more of a long term. Uh, it has a more proven track history to provide a long term uh, relief of water milfoil. Mm -hmm. So in in a pretty much in a pinch where we would treat an area and let's say it comes back the following month then we would not necessarily that year but following prior to the next year we would go immediately after the dmf restriction of june 1st and use Procellicor to hopefully knock it back and we don't have to manage that area again for milfoil okay and Based on my reading of the reports, there really isn't much water milfoil. It's very right. sparse and it's not an issue. Yes. Okay. I don't know, Dave Kaplan, what do you think? What, what was your proposed um, moratorium? What was the April 1st? April 1st or... to June 30th. And that's based on the, the um, DMF for yeah. day, day right. with the fish run. Is that, Tanner, are you okay with that? Because I think that would effectively remove diquat as a treatment or, or remove uh, any available treatment for the curly leaf pondweed because it would have already senesced um, at that point. Yes. I mean, are people trying to get in the water and use it at the boat club on June 30th, I guess? 
So I would say yes. <laughs> I mean, there's so like at least the two areas that we're treating, they technically are like they're kind of like swim areas. Right. So I would still I would still like to ask for dive squat. Um in case of like maybe possibly like bladder war pops up or anything like that. I know I know I'm just sorry, speaking out of knowledge of uh at least the upper mystic lake they have uh coontail that comes by from time to time at least in the upper four bays so just in case that okay. possibly finds its way down the stream sure sure good um i'm okay with i think we approved for core for another aquatic management did we not i thought we did anybody on the water bodies Group. It sounds familiar, but I could be mixing it up with something at work. I um, Tanner, recall. do you know if the toxicity is different from Diquat or the same, or you know, in terms of uh, toxicity to things you don't want it to be toxic to? Um, no, it's pretty good. It it's pretty. Uh, what am I trying to say? It's pretty. It's only really known to attack milfoil. It's pretty. Subject. Specific. It's specific. It's species specific. Yeah. Okay. Targeted. Targeted. That, that's Thank you. there we go. Yeah. Targeted. Okay. I'm okay with that because I think we've I think we've used it before. I know I've researched it, but um. okay. I think like uh we have some conditions. And I I would just say that the conditions that we had in the prior permit. You know, I can work with with Dave Morgan on the exact number of them because we add, we modified or added a few. But we, if I forgot anything, we definitely want at least the ones in the prior permit. Okay, I don't think that we forgot. Okay. okay, I guess last question: Is this an approval for two, three, or five years, commissioners? So, right. The applicant asked for five. Um, the last time DMF said, do not approve more than two because you want to see how it's doing. Um, that kind of fell off because they only did a few years and then didn't treat. Um, I'd be fine with three years, which is our normal permit time. I'm, I'm hesitant about doing five years at this point. Okay. Um, that's my I, opinion. I only saw Susan and Nathaniel agreeing. Does everyone agree to that? Three-year yes. permit? Okay. Okay. So we have our conditions. It's a three-year permit. Can I get a motion to issue? Motion so to issue. Sorry. <laughs> so that was Susan. And can I have a second? Second. Second. So we're, we're issuing with the conditions we described and the conditions that were in the previous permit. Um, Mike Gildeskane. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Susan Chapnick. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. You have your permit. Thank you, board. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Tana, for yeah, answering Tana. our questions. Thank you. Appreciate it. No problem. You guys have been great. Have a good one. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving right along, we have uh, a notice of intent from Monotomy Rocks Park, file a DEP file number. Um, I think it's 910365. This is a continuation of the August 1st Conservation Commission meeting. The Conservation Commission will hear will continue the public hearing under the Wetlands Protection Act to consider uh, under the Wetlands Protection Act and the bylaw to consider a notice of intent for replacement of a playground, Monomery Rocks Park in Arlington. Um, the area to be altered includes buffer zone and adjacent upland resource area associated with an isolated vegetated wetland. Um, I'm not sure if uh, who's here to start this presentation. Uh, I'm not sure. So Emily Wolf was on the application. Um, and if it's not Emily Wolf from uh, Copley and Wolf, then whoever's giving the presentation, please introduce uh, yourself and introduce your team and bring the Conservation Commission up to pro up to uh, up to speed on your project. I see Natasha. 
Yeah. Yep. Is that you, Natasha? Hi. That's me. How are okay. you? Okay. Good. Um, thanks for having us again. I uh, will just introduce um, Emily Hunt and Katie Cruz. They are here from um, our team um, and they are going to present this. And I also want to recognize that uh, Leslie Mayer from our commission is also on the phone, uh, on the on the call. Uh, and we're just, we're here in the background if there's any questions or uh, we need to step in, but I will turn it over to uh, Emily. Great, thank you, Natasha. And thank you to the commission for having us again. Um, we were on the um, previous commission meeting on August 1st to present the notice of intent for Monotomy Rocks Park. And that includes removal of some of the existing play equipment um, that's very close to the wetland. And we're proposing the new design. Um, we shared that with the commission on the August 1st meeting. And based on that conversation, the commission had three requirements for us. Um, those three requirements were to provide an operations and maintenance manual for the playground area. Um, to provide additional habitat enhancement in the rest the resource areas and to provide a specification on the riprap in the level spreader. So we provided that information to the commission as an addenda to the NOI. Um, and I'm happy to share my screen if it would be helpful to look at plans, um, if that's the easiest way to proceed. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, and you could show us the updates on the plans. Sure. Just give me a moment while I share my screen. Is everyone able to see my screen? Yes. OK, great. Um, I'll just pull up the plan first. Is everyone able to see the plan? Mm -hmm. OK, great. Thank you. Um, so this is the plan. Um, We've made some minor changes from last time for anyone who wasn't on the call last time. Um, this project includes a new play area that is within the 100 foot buffer. Um, there is a pavilion that's outside the buffer zone um, and an accessible pathway that leads into the play area as well. Um, the current playground um, swing is located quite a bit closer to the wetland area. so. Our plan pulls all of the play equipment outside um, of the 20 foot, 25 foot buffer um, in between the 50 and 100 foot buffer. Um, one of the requests from last the last meeting was to expand the mitigation planting area. Um, so you can see this darker hatch is that expanded zone. Um, we had really been tighter to that existing swing location, which as I zoom in, you can see the underlay of the current survey. Um, and we had originally proposed a native lawn mix up here, but we've now changed it to that mitigation planting. Um, per the converse, conservation's request, we've added in trees. You can see three tree plantings and some shrub massings as well. In the mitigation planting, is a native seed mix um, that would provide that ground cover layer. The shrubs are the mid-level layer and different sizes of shrubs, and then the trees for the canopy to really connect the existing canopy. Um, and I will just zoom out so we can look at the plant schedule for this area. Um, so the three trees we've proposed are all native species and just straight species, um, no varieties. So it's a red maple, swamp white oak, and red oak. And for shrubs, we have a mix of four different um, perennials. So it would be summer sweet, sweet fern, elderberry, and viburnum. I'm just gonna zoom out a little bit. Um, so that's the plan. I'm happy to pause here if there are any questions or I can keep going through the other items um, that were requested by the commission. I don't see any hands raised. Up okay. uh, one. Uh, Brian? Yeah, just a quick question. Uh, the, the trees that you plant, will they be canopy trees eventually? How, how tall do you expect them to grow? And in general, I just, I'm complimentary on the changes you've made. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, yes, these would be full canopy trees. So um, red maple, red oak, swamp white oak, those are all very tall canopy trees. Um, a lot of times red maple is more of a secondary species. So that needs a little bit more light to get to its full height. 
Um, but oak trees definitely grow quite tall. Um, trees are always limited by trees around them. So in terms of like limb spread and full size of canopy, um, they'll always be limited by the environment around each other. Um, but because these are in a bit more of that opening, I would expect these would achieve their full mature height. Susan. Thank you, Chuck. Sure. Yeah. Um, just because I was recently at the Park and Rec meeting and there was some discussion about concern that Park and Rec may not have funds for this mitigation area. So I want to get some information from Park and Rec about whether this is doable before the commission keeps going, because I think the commission likes this mitigation and I don't want to get too further on before we understand is this viable. Yeah, so, so I'm oh, sorry. I was just going to say, and it, that that um, ability to plant this area in our permits is within a three-year span. So just take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I'm happy to start. And then if Leslie would like to chime in, um, we can do that way. So um, this project does have a very limited budget, and it's primarily for the play area. Um, so with the project that's currently out to bid right now, we're not including the trees and shrubs in that part of the project. However, the Parks Commission is committed to um, including this as part of the stipulations by the Conservation Committee. So they will be finding funding for this because they understand it's a very key part of the project. So um, Leslie, if there's anything else you'd like to add, please feel free to do so. Sure, let me just jump in on that. Um, as Emily said, um, you know, we are committed to the, to the plantings and we, um, we support the vision for what we want to do here. It's good to know that it's three years. Uh, we have done some outreach. We've gotten some commitments. Um, we've out, we've, uh, reached out, you know, as Emily said, this is, was not originally in the funding. This is a very limited funding project, limited funding project, um, However, we have reached out to the friends to see if they're, they might be um, consider, if they would consider contributions. We've also reached out to the town. Um, I know um, if Natasha wants to speak, I know she's heard back from Mike Rademacher. Um, and so we're, we're confident that at least, you know, even if it's not, even if the funds aren't available through the bid, there are avenues that we have that we are pursuing to ensure that the that the planting does happen. So we are committed to that. And I would just reiterate uh, exactly what Leslie said. I did have a conversation, uh, email exchange with um, Mike Rademacher, and we <clears throat> will be working with the tree committee as well. Um, and they assured us that the town does have uh, trees that would be available. And this is something that we can certainly get done. So yeah, between the town and uh, the friends, we're we're certainly um, confident. Great. So so we might want to, if we get further down, I know you have other things to discuss. Talk about a phased approach, like you might do the plantings later, which is probably a better idea after all the construction anyway. Obviously, because you don't have them right now, anyhow. Hey, I see Brian McBride has his hand up again. Yeah, just uh, maybe to you, Chuck, the question would be, so how would this work? Would we write the conditions for this planting in our approval? And it would be a sort of certificate of conformance would not would be withheld if it wasn't done. Is that the, the process? Um, yeah, so that's a tr uh, pretty tricky question. I mean, your homeowner needs a certificate of compliance, but the town doesn't. So it really doesn't have as much weight if, if you wanted to kind of hold it. I would, I would try to come up with a condition that gets you to where you want to be rather than relying on the certificate of compliance process to have, um, you know, to have the planting established at that time. That's, that's what, how I would approach this. Um, maybe uh, people can think about that as we move further along in this uh, discussion. Leslie Mayer has her hands up. 
Yes, I, I was just going to say, you know, we did extensive planting when we did the reservoir project. And I know at the end of the project, um, David Morgan had, had really just kind of started in with the town and he came out to review the planting. Um, and it was done, I mean, as you all know, and as you pointed out, Susan, you know, sometimes plantings will have to happen seasonally. So, you know, your spring planting, your fall planting, depending on uh, on the um, the variety of the tree. So it, it may not happen at the same time as the playground work is done, but I know that we have worked with the conservation agent to ensure that the work and the plantings are done within a timely, um, timely fashion. Thank you. Hi, Nathaniel Stevens. Thanks. I, when Leslie mentioned the uh, reservoir project, I was actually thinking of the reservoir dam project too, the earlier project where the park and rec committed to planting a whole bunch of trees. And I think that was done sort of after the, it had to be done after that work was done and they followed up, I, I think, and I was going to say, I, th I think we ran out of room for for trees, so maybe there are three three left from that project that could be used here. So I think we can manage that aspect of it, even without a holding a, a withholding a certificate of compliance. Sounds like you have a great track record, Leslie. You and your committee. Okay, um, maybe we can continue this presentation at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so the other question. Um, was about the riprap size at the level spreader. Based on the conversation, it sounded like the commission preferred a size over two inches, but less than 10 inches for the stone at the, um, at the level spreader. So um, we would propose using a mix of stones ranging from three to five inches, and that we would require the contractor to provide us a one gallon sample at the site to approve. It would need to be a stone that's native to New England, um, just matching New England colors, which are typically tan and gray. Um, and having a physical sample, like a one gallon pail, is a very common practice um, on these types of projects. Are there any questions about the riprap? No, I don't see any. Okay, great. So then from here, the final question um, was on Pardon me, just while I bring this up. Um, the final item was on the um, operation and maintenance manual for the playground area. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna jump here. Um, so the surfacing that we have proposed is engineered wood fiber. We went over that in detail at our last meeting, um, but just for anyone who maybe wasn't there or just as a quick reminder, that is an all natural soft wood. Um, it does not contain any bark. So the pieces are um, a more uniform size um, and it does meet national um, playground safety requirements for fall and impact attenuation. Um, in Massachusetts, we are required to use um, a type of black matting over parts of it to allow for accessibility. Um, in terms of maintenance for that, we would defer to the Consumer Product Safety Guideline Handbook um, in 2015, the Public Playground Safety Handbook that has been published um, that has requirements for loose fill, which is this type of material. Um, it does need to be raked and occasionally replenished because it's a loose fill, it can compact over time. So it would be great if parks and DPW can review it annually to make sure um, that the fill is sufficient. And typically for playground pieces, the um, playground vendors do mark the posts with the required depth. So it's easy for someone um, at parks or DPW to see if the fill is below the required line and they're able to reorder it um, yearly or annually as needed. In terms of the black rubber mats, those are quite durable. They're also quite heavy. So we don't anticipate those will walk off. They will be bound together. And we would just recommend that someone checks them annually to make sure all the fasteners are in place. They're also very easy to reorder should any um, become damaged, but they are pretty durable. Um, the engineered wood fiber will be bounded by the timber edging, especially on the low side. 
Um, so that should help maintain keeping the fiber in place. Um, if a little bit does get displaced, you know, if kids are running around, kids do pick it up. Um, it is an organic material, so it would just decompose. We don't really see that as an issue. Um, and in terms of the play equipment, we've selected primarily wooden play equipment. It's a robinia wood, which is a very durable material. It's used frequently in the playground industry. And we would suggest that um, the parks and DPW follow the vendor's guidelines um, for how to check it and repair it. Um, we did provide a maintenance manual. Um, Compan is the vendor that we are using for this project. And they provided a very thorough guideline of how to check um, the pieces of equipment. Um, they also provided photos. There is some natural cracking that happens on the wood. So that's to be anticipated. But if there are larger cracks or slivers, those are all pieces that can be addressed, um, easily addressed. And should any pieces be completely vandalized, that's when we can work with the vendor to get replacements and all pieces will come with a warranty. Depending on the material, if it's a metal fastener that typically has a longer warranty, um, the wood also has a warranty. So we can work with vendors um, should any pieces need to be fixed or repaired or replaced. Um, I'm not gonna go through every page on this unless, um, unless there's a request, but this does have really helpful guidelines of how to check um, checking for missing pieces, checking to make sure everything's working. Um, we do have a variety of pieces. We have some net climbing pieces, um, moving pieces. So there will be a lot of different parts to check, but the town also has used this playground vendor in many other areas. So they're very familiar with how to check um, these different pieces and they have a working relationship with the vendor as well. So it's very easy communication wise to get replacement parts or to get someone out there to check things if needed. Um, I think that was it for this piece of it. Um, I realized I did also wanna to touch on in terms of the habitat enhancement. Um, we did include um, an operations and maintenance manual um, for plants in here. Again, I'm not gonna go over every single page um, unless there are specific questions, um, but these are general guidelines in terms of like pruning and watering for trees that we typically see on projects. Um, and then there had been a question too on invasive species control. And, oh, I'm sorry, the, um, the lights in my office go off. Um, sorry about that. Um, in terms of invasive species control um, in research, it looks like the Friends of Monotomy does pretty extensive invasive species control um, meetups. And so based on that, I would recommend um, partnering up with the Friends group and then also having DPW um, you know, do additional inspections as needed. Um, so with that, I would love to hear any comments or questions or feedback. Sure, uh, Susan Chapnick has her hand up. Yes, thank you, Emily. Um, and I, I wanted to thank you also and Park and Rec for, for your very um, complete um, submittals that we asked for. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I will say that we at, at the commission have some of our own um, revegetation and plant conditions. And if we put those in, they would usurp your yours. Um, so, for example, um, I noticed you have a one-year guarantee. We require three-year survivability, 100% uh, of trees and 80% of other um, vegetation that's been um, planted. Um, we have certain requirements on the type of fertilizer you can use in the time of year. You can put it down. Um, we have um, mitigation plantings need to be um, maintained in perpetuity, meaning they can't be pulled out in the future, even when the permit is expired. And so we have things like that that are going to go in and go. I, it, it's nothing Park and Rec doesn't know about already, because these are similar things to what we would have put in. We did put in the reservoir. I'm just, you know, telling you, Emily, just as an FYI. Um, but I found that the submittal was very um, complete and robust, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, David Kaplan. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I echo Susan on you know the submittal and how thorough it was. Thank you very much for putting this all together uh, in a way we can easily read it and digest it. Um, 
I have a question about the mitigation planting seed mix. Um, it says C spec, and forgive me if I missed it, but do you have the species and what is the, I guess, the intent of that mix? How it will be managed, I guess, differently from, like, say, the lawn or anything else on site? Yes, absolutely. Um, that was included in the original NOI package. Oh, okay. um, just give me a moment while I bring that up. Uh, my apologies. It'll take just a minute to find the right yeah, page. I was just looking at the addendum so I didn't think to go back to the original. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, give me just a moment to no, no, no. find that. I know what's in here. Emily, has this been mixed that we discussed in terms of um, replacing the earned seed mix with um, the new and wetland plants mix? Correct. So um, when I had originally talked to David, I was proposing some earned seed mixes. Um, we did decide New England wetland plants had better seed mixes available. Oh, here we are. Um, so in the original NOI, we had provided a more rough diagram of these areas. You can see the smaller mitigation planting zone, which we've now expanded since mm -hmm. then. Um, and then based on that, we provided four different seed mixes. Um, so we have this kind of orange color is more of a shade mix because there's more forest canopy on this side. Um, this lighter green is the lawn because that's existing condition. Um, we have a rain garden seed mix here in the level spreader and then the mitigation planting is this darker green color. Um, so these were the four mixes that we had proposed. Um, so this one is the New England wetland plants for detention basins and moist sites. The second one was the semi-shade grass and forbs mix. The third mix was the native warm season grass mix, although I do want to um, flag that it does have a mix of warm and cool season grasses. And then the final was the wetland seed mix. And so the wetland seed mix is the one that's proposed for the mitigation area. Correct, yes. Okay. Okay, great. Um, does that, does that just set it and forget it? Or does that need to be managed sort of like cut once a year for regeneration, mm -hmm. like managed like a meadow? Or is that just once it's down? It's, it's going. So I think the intent was always for this area to be more of a set and forget it. We would require the contractor um, warranty it. So if for some reason the seed doesn't take, they would need to reseed it until we accept it. Um, so we have the right to reject it if it's weedy or patchy. Um, so it would be vegetated. Um, based on the species. A lot of times you can set it and forget it, although certain species sometimes become more dominant. So depending on the blend, um, even if a species might start as a 50% part of the mix, um, the germination rate may not always be 100%, and that species may eventually sometimes lose out to a more dominant species. So um, there's a potential that the um, total percentages of species will change over time, but I think that's always kind of an exciting piece of native plants. Understood. All right. Thanks for that explanation. Appreciate it. No more questions. Sure. Emily had a follow-up on that. Um, so wetland seed mist is usually cast in the fall and overwintered. Is there a note on the plan for the contractor to do such a thing? So if it doesn't freeze in, it usually doesn't grow well in the spring. So based on our um, based on our construction timeline, we were anticipating primarily spring planting for this project. Um, if the seed doesn't take, I think we could talk to Leslie and see if the Parks Commission is willing to have the contractor come back for a fall planting if we think that's a better opportunity. Um, but that's something I would need to discuss with Leslie and Natasha. Is there a is there the same guarantee on this um, seed mix, a one-year guarantee? Yes. Yes, I'm yeah. hearing that. Okay. Um, 
I don't see any other commissioners open, but I did have one more question. So on your operation and maintenance plan, I think it was um, 3.6, it says mulch, mulch areas maintenance. I was, um, my concern at the last meeting was that the mulch was going to migrate over the barrier and into the um, wetland seed mix. And I would, and I was hoping to see, and I'm asking if you could do that, but we could also do this as a condition that uh, annually the mulch that um, gets out of the play area and into the mitigation area is raked up and uh, either put back into the <laughs> into the playground area or taken off site. Yeah, I, th I think that's something we could definitely entertain. Um, I would not recommend necessarily putting it back into the play area just because it may contain um, natural organic material like soil and, um, oh, sorry, Leslie has her hand up. Leslie, if you'd like to chime in, feel free. That's okay. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, you know, part part of what we did uh, talk to Emily about is this is the exact type of discussion that the, that the Park and Rec Commission is expecting to come out of phase two of the land management plan. Um, you know, how do we deal with maintenance of this type? It's not just for monotony. It's across the town when we use wood chips at a playground, um, if the play, you know, if those wood chips are near a wetland site, how do we deal with it? If they're not near a wetland site, there's a lot of maintenance discussion that needs to happen within the town. And that's why we kind of pushed David Morgan to go after uh, phase two of that public land management plan to actually have those discussions from a, a broader perspective from a safety and conservation perspective so that we can certainly deal with DPW as one voice with a mm. plan for the town. So we would expect that to, to be part of that plan. Sure, uh, I think it would help out this approval also and you could, and, and other approvals to come through. And then if there was a broader, maintenance plan townwide, then you can, you know, obviously they would say, wh wh where is that required? And and this is might be the first one where it's required, but um, I do think it's using, a good idea. I was just gonna say, cause we're using mulch down at the res as an example in, in a, you know, resource area um, near the beach. Uh, you know, not that it's that close to water, it's kind of separated for the, from the sand, but we're also using uh, mulch at Spy Pond Playground. So there are places where we do need to figure mm -hmm. out the right maintenance plan annually to ensure safety as well as res you know, ensuring that we're protecting resource areas. So we can put something together here, but I think understand that we're going to have a broader conversation coming up about exactly that question around maintenance. Yeah. And the issue isn't one or two pieces and the occasional wood chip. It's, it's no. when it's forgotten about for many years. And then there's almost like a ramp of wood chips that's decomposed and it's basically suffocated all the, all the plants and all the undergrowth that's, that's in that area. So absolutely. And then that and would... it's unsafe. When that happens, mm -hmm. the the safety has been compromised. If it's not at the oh. at the appropriate depth, then it's no longer a safety surface. So it does need to be looked at from both perspectives. And I know in the past we have had some major issues with it. I know the commission was quite disappointed with the way um the mulch down at Magnolia was not maintained. There has been some focus, some attention that's been put on that. More needs to be done, but it is something that we recognize as as a need in the maintenance world. Um, again, not just from conservation, 
but from a safety standpoint, because if it's migrating and being carried away, then it's not at the a correct depth to be a safety surface. Okay. All right. Uh, I don't see anyone else with their hand up, so I'm going to turn. Um, Emily, can you uh, turn off the screen? Thank you. Um, if anyone would like to speak about this project, if they could just use uh, the reaction button, raise hand function, or simply get our attention by waving. I see, um, I don't see anyone at this point. Uh, does anyone would like to speak about this project? Playground at Monotomy Rocks Park. Okay, seeing none, back to the commission for further comments or motions. I make a motion to close the hearing. No second. I'll second. Susan Chaffnick and David Kaplan. Uh, Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. David White. Yes. Mike killed this game. Yes. <clears throat> Susan Chapnick. Yes. Nathaniel Stevens. Yes. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. And Chuck Taroni says yes. I think I got everyone. David Kaplan says yes. David Kaplan. <laughs> the other Nathaniel. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank um, person. <laughs> Okay, so we're at the point where we want to talk about conditions um, with the commission. Any uh, commissions that come up, I'd like to have my uh, once a year rake the uh, any the side of the um, well. I just say all the mulch needs to be maintained inside the play area, the playground area, and if it if it comes out or migrates out of that, it needs to be picked up at least once a year. Any Did other? you say raked or maintained? I don't. I, I just said picked up. I didn't put it specify how it would happen. I could also annually. Yeah, I could also add the uh, rain garden. If there are any sediments in the rain garden, it has to re be removed, monitored, and at least removed once a year. We're looking for, you know, sand or some sort of sediment that would kill off the shrubs and plants that are in there. I would like to just add that our general planting conditions, which include um, conditions on survival of plants for three years uh, with annual reporting to the Conservation Commission, 80% um, of non-trees, 100% of trees. Yeah. Um, we have our standard condition on the type of fertilizer and, and application, which I don't remember off the top of my head, but David Morgan knows it. Um, no pesticides, herbicides, or rodenticides are allowed to be used in this area because it's within wetland jurisdiction. Um, invasives will have to be, if they are removed, will have to be manual removal because we didn't approve any herbicides for this project. Um, and the mitigation planting area has to be maintained in perpetuity that extends beyond the expiration of the permit. I think I got most of them. Okay. Any uh, any concern about um, the planting discussion we had where it's not funded as part of the first round? Any conditions that we would add for that or is it... Um... Well, the permit's for three years. So mm -hmm. I would ask Park and Rec if is that enough time for you or would you need us to put a condition that extends that no i think i'm seeing leslie say three okay, years, three years is, fine. is sufficient for you to get the okay great okay. then i think we don't need a special condition okay right. if that's it i'll entertain a motion to issue i missed the last hearing so i can't vote on this but i do support the project thanks nathaniel I think we have a quorum anyway. Right. Yeah. Motion to issue. Uh, motion to issue order of conditions with the conditions discussed. Have a second. Second. I'll second it. So Mike that was Gildas. Dave, Dave Kaplan. And Mike Gildas game. And Mike? Okay. Gildas game. Yeah. And um, I would just say condition your your motion to issue the permit under both the Wetlands Protection Act and the bylaw. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
All right, David Kaplan and Mike Gildas game. Um, David White? Yes. Susan Chapnick? Yes. David Kaplan? Yes. David White? Oh, did I say David White? Who did I miss? Jesus. Again. Yes. <laughs> and Chuck Cerrone says yes. <laughs> I say yes, too. And David, yeah, thanks. Okay, I think we got everybody somehow. <laughs> <laughs> And Nathaniel is recused. So that's it. You're abstaining. abstaining. You're, you're abstaining. Um, that's it. The permit will be issued um, soon, but you have to talk to David Morgan about that. We have 21 days to issue. So that's when that'll Thank happen. You. Thank you for coming and uh, appreciate Russia, all the information. Well, yes. And, Thank and you so much. Leslie and yeah, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. All right. On to our last meeting for tonight's agenda. 103 Thorndike, DEP file number 91-0364. The Conservation Commission will continue the public hearing under the Wetlands Protection Act to consider a notice of intent for construction of a multifamily residence at 103 Thorndike Street in Arlington. The area to be altered includes bordering land subject to flooding associated with the Alewhite Brook. We conducted a site visit on Sunday, August 11th, um, and it was attended by Susan Chapnick, Brian McBride, and myself. I wonder if we can get an update from either Susan or Brian, or I'm available to uh, give that update also. But I'm wondering if David Morgan has the pictures that I sent to him. And after that, we'll have the applicant uh, continue their presentation. Does, uh, let's see, Brian or Susan, you want to give an update on our site visit? Um, David, do you have that? I sent an email on the update. Didn't I do that? I'm trying to find it. I think I sent an email yeah. to um, with update notes. Did I not? You did, Susan. It was good. Okay. You did. I have the notes and... The notes and the pictures. So I guess I need both because <laughs> I can't find mine. Um, it's on the drive. Why don't I put the, uh, the notes up first? Does that make Great. sense? Great. Great. And then we can show the pictures. Wonderful. Thank you. Hello. Okay. So um, just so uh, the first was, was just say what they can. The construction involves regrading in the back to remove about a foot um, to level out the yard. It was good to see that actually in in real in real you know put our feet to the ground and see it. The rain garden and bioswale is at the lowest point in the yard where the water is going right now, which was also good to see that it was an appropriate placement um, for where that is going. Um, there's a manhole on town land, which is Magnolia Park, um, right um, adjacent to where the rain garden is going. Um, so if the rain garden overflows, and it would have to overflow a little uphill actually, because the rain garden is a low point. So it's unlikely that would happen, but if it did, it would go to the, the manhole um, yeah. where a surface overflow is going currently anyway, if that happens. Um, there are several large mature trees on the property that that we noticed that we're concerned um, are are going to be protected, and the applicant included tree protection. But in addition to tree protection, um, there's a large mature oak tree whose roots might be impacted by the construction of the house. And um, Chuck can talk further when we get to that when we show the pictures about um, suggested. Um, protocol during construction to save that tree. Um, we talked about that only 20% of the trees could be pruned if they needed to be, and they might because there's some big willows that are overhanging, some beautiful trees. Um, there's an old chain link fence around the entire property. Um, we talked about the fact that if they put in a new fence, um, that they they need to leave some room for critters to go underneath. Um, and we recommended that they reach out, and I should ask Park and Rec to stay on the line here. <laughs> I forgot about that. But reach out to Park and Rec, which are those, those 
guide those uh, staff members that were at the previous um, hearing um, to talk about tree trimming and tree protection because the trees are partly or wholly on town land and um, the fencing removal and replacement. Um, because again, the fence, some of it's on this property and some of it's on um, town land, the Magnolia Park. So that's all I have and we can put up the pictures and talk further. Okay. Yeah, so it's yeah. looking Go from... Ahead. You, yeah, you narrate sure. your track. That will be helpful. Yeah, so sure. We're on the street looking towards the back of the house. They're standing in the rain garden area with a discharge to screen left. And that's where the storm drain is located, just beyond the chain link fence. And this area is actually on this left-hand side. There's actually two fences. They're about five feet apart. Um, just a curious note. But the chain link fence closest to... Uh, the people down at the end, the commission members and the applicant are, well, that chain link fence is the property line. As you can see, they have uh, beautiful weeping willow, some um, maple trees in the back, and um, they all need to be trimmed. So trimming is going to be part of this project also. So there's the chain and again, uh, you can just see on the screen right some of the structure. This is just a, you know, uh, center block support which talks more about the construction and the the uh of this house and why they're taking it down i guess the next picture yeah and then uh brian mcbride rode his bike there and um this is the driveway again we're looking from the street down to the uh, rain garden that's proposed next picture this is along the front uh you know, not too much to say here. Uh, the setback, as you can see, it probably is, doesn't meet current standards uh, and it may have to be moved back. We did look for um, street drains. I didn't think, I, I didn't see any, uh, so there was no street drain, but if there is, they would be putting a silt sack in that uh, drain and of course sweeping the street at night uh, at the end of each day that they're working. Next picture, if there's one, and that's it. Okay, uh, one of the pictures we did want to show you is uh, the back corner. I guess that one didn't uh, get to David, but the back corner of the house, looking from the back of the house up towards the house, there's a drop of approximately one foot, and that is going to be cut. So from what I'm hearing is that um, there's going to be a one, like a one foot cut in the back, but it's going to be hidden mostly by the um, the building that they're putting in there. So it's just going to be feathered into the existing grade. That's really all I have to say. It's easier just with a picture, but yeah, yeah. And there's the there's the drainage system. Yeah, the drainage system and the contours. These are two foot contour so it won't show the one foot change in elevation to yeah. the back of the site but you can get a sense of the topography anyway or the existing topography and then there's the drain at the back of the site Chuck was just referring to if I zoom out a little bit you'll see that that goes down across Thorndike down Fairmont out to Elway Brook so mm. it's ultimately running a few blocks away into their life. Yeah, so any of that runoff going into the rain garden would be filtered out and I guess cleaner than just overland flow. But with our fertilizer our restrictions, it would be uh, pretty clean. I'm not sure if that storm drain is clean. No one, no one went over there to see if it's actually functioning, but um, the intent that is it is functioning and um, the discharge point of the rain garden is directly towards that storm drain. So with that, um, Hardy Mann, the design group uh, is representing uh, this notice of intent. And I think, uh, let's see, I'm looking for, oh, there is cheese right there. If you could introduce yourself for the record and then uh, your team and then bring the commission up to date on your project. 
I, I missed the chairman, Sean Hardy. I, she, I think, oh, is, sure. in, is, is, is in his car. If he, well, he's going to chip in if needed. He had an event this evening, so I have the computer with the ability to share the screen, if that's okay. That's fine. Okay. Hopefully, I do okay. And uh, by the way, my name is Sean Hardy, professional engineer with Hardy and Man Design, Hardy Plus Man Design Group. Um, I want to also say that I fat finger typed. Member McBride is good till January thirty first of two thousand and twenty six, not the twenty first. So, per those um, per the selectman's um, record there. But oh, thank you. So we have. We, we revised the plan based on the last meeting. I don't know if you want me to go in this. So you, you know that there's a there's an existing single family residence. It's a proposed to be torn down with a proposed two family residence. Um, it ends up being a reduction in pervious area because we are removing a significant amount of pavement and the new driveway is going to be permeable pavers. Um, at the last meeting, we were tasked with um, a site visit which as you just recapped, um, additionally, to confirm the new flood zone, how this project compared with the new flood zone, it, it is in fact the same flood elevation um, for the approved versus the proposed. Um, the next thing that was requested was a planting list and, and thankfully staff provided that. So we have added the number and quantity and type of proposed plantings that is going to go into that bioretention area. We have a one red maple, one flowering dogwood, two winterberry, and then switch grass to, to fill it in. Um, the next thing was a tree protection detail. We, we gave an example of it. Uh, hopefully that's enough. I don't, I don't know that it actually calls specifics, but it's the two by fours wrapped around the trees to avoid the nicking of the, um, the bark. Um, we wanted to confirm that it's a swale that's directing the water, the water down to the back. And as you can see, the way these contours here, they're all directing the water in towards. And then as it gets in the back, it gets into that bioretention area. And I think when you all were out there, you saw that that is the low point. The water is going there anyway. We're, we're adding to that a little with the cuts that we're doing just because we're in that flood zone. We wanted to make sure we were cutting at every elevation. I, I touched on that at the last meeting, but that table is is here on the plan. We are providing more flood storage at every elevation on, on the site. Um, confirming no tree removal. And I think as you saw that you saw the site, they, uh, the trees are generally either straddling the property line or on the parks department side. Um, so I, I think with the tree protection detail, but we are confirming that we are not removing any trees and the request of the paver detail, which it was on the plan and forgive me for the last time I had not prepared the plan I was filling in, but it is on the plan and it was on the plan and that's over here. It's those permeable pavers with the gaps in between and the sand base below and then the double washed clean stone but beneath it that allows for the, for that infiltration. Um, Additionally, at the site walk, I know there was talk about replacing the fence. Uh, today, we updated the plan and thankfully staff acknowledged that that was received and, and could be added to the record. We show a five foot cedar fence detail with that four inch gap below it that the members had requested to allow for critters to get back and forth under there. Um, I. I Again, I don't know if you want me to rehash the project or I, I think this is the update of what we did. And, and I think we have answered. Sure. Do you have an uh, do you have an update on uh, engineering's review oh, of the stormwater? I do. We we reached out to them. They were. They have not finished the review and they indicated that they weren't sure that we sent the check, but we downloaded today that they had cashed the check for the review fee on August 2nd, so I'm not sure why they didn't know that, but we supplied them with that today, a, a PDF of the front and back of the of the cash check of the stormwater permit fee. So it, it's definitely been applied for. 
they just haven't gotten to it. I know they had some staff turnover over there. Um, so we're, we're still a little in the air with that, but I, I can say our, our, our project, we're reducing impervious area. We're, we're adding that, um, bioretention area to provide additional treatment for anything. Um, I, I can't imagine what they would come back with. Would be certainly happy to accept a condition that if we have to modify the drainage for for something that they come up with, we could we could do that. I, I, I in my mind, I can't think what that might be though. And uh, this is cheap, by the way. Um, um, on my car, <laughs> um, uh, we did receive the email from uh, the the uh that um the um, uh, what do you call the assistant town engineer? I think he's a temporary town engineer right now. Um, that he acknowledged that the uh use of permeable paper is a is the approved mitigations that um uh be used to uh mitigate the runoff. So that is a good sign. Um, and then we have provide a storm water report that we reduce every single storm to ten twenty five and hundred year storm. Uh, on the peak float and also the volume and also that the storm that we use on the uh, drainage study is the I believe is NOAA 13 or something like that um, so which complied to the uh, town uh, latest requirement yeah yeah at the last time we had re I, I I know one of the members had asked that question about what storms we used and, and we did use the extreme storms All right. Uh, that was the final question. Uh, I guess uh, any of the commission members have any other questions for this project, about this project? And I see Nathaniel Stevens' hand is up. Thanks. Um, I can't vote on this because I missed the first hearing, but I'm just noticing the flood storage volume information on the plan is not clear to me. There's existing and proposed on that table, and maybe you guys discuss this. Stop me if you guys already discussed this, but it doesn't show what what elevation is being filled. Uh, yes. at what at what elevations are there fill, and is that being uh, compensated for two to one under our bylaw? We're not filling at all. You're not so, filling at all. Okay. No. So it's it's a cut. So this table it, for us when we prepared this table, it was a it. And it's probably a little different than what you're looking, you're used to looking. Yeah, at. exactly. Yeah, yeah. We're we're completely a cut. So we're, we give the volume that exists now and we're creating more. So there is no fill. And, and that was a question that we kind of floated out to staff. If we're not filling, what are we con contemplating or yeah, compensating okay. for Got two it. one? But okay. I'll zoom in over here so you can see, you know, the existing two contour goes like this across the page. We're cutting yeah. over here and then back over here. You know, oh. the, the existing three cuts through here. We're cutting way up here, F similar with four on up. So, okay, thank you. That, yeah. That's good. Yeah, okay. thanks. And again, um, just uh, chime in a little bit. And the number we present, um, the volume existing and proposed is basically the volume uh, most of it is except the existing building that took up the flood storage volume um again we we use the building mass to calculate the uh, proposed as well but in reality the the proposed building basement is going to be a flood vent so we did not take the account that the the building volume inside the uh, enclosure that is going to be also providing the 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 flood volume as well. So the number is actually really almost yeah. nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's more than what we're showing on the table is yeah. what he said. Because there's a basement now with a foundation, we're filling that in and putting flow through panels. So there's no, additional right. okay. storage yeah. that we haven't taken credit for. It's not on that table. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Susan Chapnick. Thank you, um, Chuck. Um I really I appreciate the changes that you've made um, to show us the planting plan. I think it's sufficient. It's a very small area, mm -hmm. um, so you can't like cram lots of things in it. Um, but I appreciate that it 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 looks um, like you have a variety 
of of levels and types of vegetation, which is great. Um, I just want to remind um, the commission that that the back you do have pilings that are going in. Uh, if, for those of when I went to see the the uh, on the site visit, I was kind of surprised at how tilted this existing houses and oh my god what you know how could anybody live in there and so so that's getting um remediated obviously i just want to mention that i am pleased that there are um positive um that we're meeting in this project it looks like you're meeting climate change resilience standards by increasing flood storage on the site um, by reducing impervious surface and providing green infrastructure for stormwater um, basically the, the rain garden. Um, so I'm very pleased to, to see those attributes um, in this area of floodplain. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, any other questions from the commissioners? The only other thing I had, Chuck, is if you wanted to discuss or you wanna do that in conditions, um, how to protect the root of that mature oak tree. Well, it was just a condition. Um, okay. If you can zoom into the tree where the addition is on the screen left side towards the back, uh, David you want Morgan. Me to stop is... sharing, or do you? No, no, no. I'm asking you just to zoom share. in. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't want to speak over you, but I didn't understand. If you go the other way. Yeah. And that tree right there is, if you can see it, it's almost where it says That's... stone swale trench, but don't follow the arrow. It's. Okay. Right here. Yeah, so that tree looks very close to the addition, and we were concerned that um, the roots, and of course, <laughs> the drip line of the tree is inaccurate on the plan, and it, it looks like it extends well into the yard. So we were concerned that the roots would get severed and frayed, and we were going to, I just said I was going to ask for a condition that um, the roots were cleaned and uh, and treated if needed, and Possibly the condition could um, also uh, involve having an arborist look at the roots prior to um, backfilling. Well, so Mr. Chair, that that's the, the back part of that building is piles. So I don't know that there's actual excavation other than there's- Oh, there's be, no excavation there? Well, sure. th there's gonna be a pile cap, but the, the that foundation is not a, a standard foundation. It, it's piles down um, obviously you saw the condition of the building and, and, and the soils. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that back portion of the building is going to be supported by piled foundation with a, with a pile cap and then coming up from that. So I, I don't know how much, certainly willing to have a con a, a condition that if there is excavation that has to happen there, we're, we're willing to that. Um, I just don't know that that's actually. Sure. If there's excavation, be, but and yeah. root damage, then it would be then into the condition yeah. for, uh, you know, okay. I'd be discussed. happy for that condition. I, I, it might be like redundant or over, but we're happy to add it. Yeah. Okay. I just uh, was concerned that that tree was very close and the roots mm -hmm. again are going to be, so it looked like the roots where you're doing the piles would be closer than three times the width of the trunk. Yep. So I was the concern was there. David Morgan, you have your hand up. Thanks, Chuck. I am a little concerned that the switchgrass might get confused for just overgrown lawn in the rain garden area. And I'm wondering if we might add a couple more shrubs in there in order to deter uh, over ambitious lawnmowers. Um, I think that and uh, the commission wanted to consider signage, you know, indicating that it is a functioning stormwater feature. I think that would help to preserve you know, the the biological function of that and the stormwater function, of course, of that feature. That's great, David. I, I like that. I was going to also mention signage for the rain garden because I'm not sure if future owners would understand what's going on there. Um, any other questions from the commissioners? I'm going to turn it over to anyone attending. I have no markers, markers oh. to the areas. 
So those are boundary markers. For, for the rain garden or for the... Well, we could, the... I'm just saying that we could use some sort of permanent marker to protect the uh, area. For the rain garden, yes. Yeah. I just think some signage there would be very beneficial just to let everybody know what's what's happening. Happy to accept either condition, different plantings or or signage and or signage. Okay. Um, if you don't mind, can you take the screen down so I can just see Certainly. who attending tonight meeting is, uh, has their hands raised. I see that uh, Joe and Susan, and we probably have others. So I'm just going to start with, I didn't see who put their hand up first, so I apologize, but I'm going to go with Nicholas. Nicholas, can you uh, ask ask your question? Good evening. Um, I'm Nick Agoris. I have I'm the director of butter at 199 slash 101 Thorndike Street. Uh, the only question that I have that I didn't see on plan because there's a grade change between my property and the, and the 103 property was there is there anything that's going to hold up my grade once they take out the fence and so forth. Uh, would you like me to respond to that? Sure. Could you? Uh... Uh, actually, I had a phone conversation with uh, with Nick today, this afternoon, and I explained to him the fence right now is um, on our side of the property. So that the new fence that go up will probably be right at the property line. Um, that is a timber, uh, more like a timber uh, wall. It's about maybe foot and a half great change difference, um, uh, short distance. So if necessary, we will replace that with um, uh, a new retaining wall. If we replace it, it will probably be a, um, like a modular block that's more long lasting and stable. It's not gonna change the grade on this property. Um, it's basically rebuild the wall to make it stable. Um, the, the existing wall is more like a timber wall, so it's not going to be uh, last too long. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you for that information. Okay. Yep. Perfect. I have so no you... further, I have no further questions. I'm all for the project and, uh, I'm happy to see a new, the new house in place. Thank you. So by replacing that timber wall with a module block wall. That's not on the plan right now, but but if that is what you're going to do, we would like. I mean, I'm. I think since we're talking about flood storage, we'd like to see that on the plan and just to prove that you don't need any compensation for it. I don't know, Sean. What do you have to say about that, Janine? Well, it's it's not going to change the gray. It's basically we praise what is what is there at mm -hmm. the same gray. Okay. I would like to see that on the plan if we're changing the wall, even okay. if we're not replacing, because we're we're changing the fences. We're we're having it on the plan. And we can certainly add that to the uh, final plans that being in record. Yeah. Okay, Susan Stamp. Um. Hi there. I'm Susan Stamps. Um. For the tree committee, I'm actually out. Uh, just listening on my phone, I have I can't I don't see what what's being shared. I can't see but, the fence, uh, and they're replacing our wall. A couple and of questions. Put it on about... plan. David, you're on top of that. Yeah, I asked for I talked to the engineer today. Yeah. And, David. And I told him, you know, I can't find he, he, so he had knowledge. I think it's Nicholas. You know, I got him. Okay, Susan, go ahead. Okay. Um. Anyhow. Um. Um. Susan Stamps here for the tree committee. A couple of questions about the trees. I heard something about um, nearby street tree or trees um, that may need branches pruned. Um, so I would just like you to advise and perhaps write it into the order that the tree town tree warden would be consulted on whatever work needs to be done on the trees. And um, the town would probably do that. And also, to the extent that they're on the property line, so that a lot of their roots are actually on the private property, um, that they take steps to pro to uh, protect those roots, which is um, basically putting a, 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 like a snow fence 
around the tree so that, or at least on the property side, so that the heavy equipment doesn't go over the roots and damage them. And I would ask the same thing for, um, I guess there are some nice trees on the property, which he's going to, he's going to put boards against them, which is great. But again, I think um, it would be even better protection to also add the snow fencing around the trees so that the equipment can't get too near and damage the roots. And those were my comments. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Joe, uh, I see that you're there. Please introduce yourself for the record. Hi, Chuck, good to see you again. Uh, it's Bill <laughs> Palmatier and everybody else as well. Uh, Bill Palmatier, 112 Thorndike Street, under my uh -huh. wife's name. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I guess I'd like to kind of start where I was last week and I'm, I'm going to apologize if, if some of my questions slash concerns are outside the scope of this meeting as they may be, um, obviously first time attending, trying to learn what decisions are made in different groups, and how do they work together. Um, but, uh, one thing, I, I guess, Che, we spoke last week, Che, am I saying it properly? Um, uh, my name, Chi. Yeah, Chi. Chi. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so last week we spoke about the, the the pylons and the the current obviously tilting of the house structure, and I believe you said you did some kind of. I, I just wanted to get in a little bit of detail about what you have done to verify that. Uh, have you done any engineering work or studies as far as how? deep you have to go to reach bedrock or whatever it is you're suggesting on the pylons if you've done any like drilling yet and if you can ascertain what the cause of the current tilting of the house was caused by what water ingress or just poor soil uh just want to get a little bit more details on that and the last thing on the regarding the pylons, I'm a little concerned. I think all of our neighbors on the street can attest to hearing pylons be put in the ground over near Alwife and some of still in the floodplain area, and that is a very vibration intensive operation and noisy. And I'd be a little concerned about the structural integrity of the surrounding houses after or during such time that this is taking place. Um, so those are kind of my questions. A, you know, what, what have we done to look at the ground as of now? Have you determined approximately what depth these pylons have to go to? I'm assuming it's around 50 to 75 feet. Um, and what can, what, what is there, what provisions are in place that say the neighbor that just spoke at 100 Thorndike, that his house or anybody's house across the street, or for even that matter, the basketball court's not damaged, cracked in a year. Okay, hey, um, I can I can answer that. So um, we have done some geotech uh, engineering in investigation on the site. Uh, there was three borings that were drilled on the site, um, we find what 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 we find is the um, the site has um, very soft soil underneath the the existing surface. That's very from I would say six feet to eight feet, and then they'll down to the um, the sand layer, which is beyond like eight feet beyond the ground. Um, so what we are proposing to do is driving uh, mini piles. These mini piles are drill piles. So they, they have a machine uh, attached to the pile. They will keep drilling until they hit certain resistance. Um, so they find in firm enough ground and they will stop. So um, these are not uh, like, Pounding piles. So if you have pounding piles, you have vibrations. Uh, with a big hammer pounding down, these are drill piles. So it doesn't really create vibrations to the uh, a 
butters or near, nearby neighbor. Uh, it just keep drilling until they hit certain resistance. So my anticipation is the pile will probably go down maybe 10, 12 feet uh, to the ground. That's that's my guess. But um, what they will do is they actually drill until they hit certain resistance. And um, that's where the, 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 the soil is firm enough and they will stop. So at this point, I can't really tell how deep they are, but I anticipate that would be somewhere around 12 feet or so. All right. Uh, so, Bill, those were, I'm going to say for me, they were pretty pretty much engineering questions, not really, not really uh, conservation questions. So, I hope you're satisfied, because uh, I'm going to move on to Michelle, uh, because I think did I, did I see you, Michelle? You waved your hands before. I know that you turned your video on. I'm not sure. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Um, I was going to speak if Bill didn't return home in time, but now that you, now that I have your attention, can I have a, I'll ask a couple of really quick questions. One is um, parking spaces out front in front of the house, two spaces, one for each unit. Is that correct? That's, you know, that's correct. In your purview, but I, I thought I'd ask it since, since Chi is here. Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, and the other thing, and you may not be able to answer this is, um, do you, any idea what caused this house to tilt the way it did? I guess we all look at we all look at it and think, is that going to happen to my house? Well, as I just explained, we did the geotechnical uh, investigations. That's about right below the existing ground surface. That's about um, maybe oh, five to eight feet, depends on where you are, of very soft soil. If you have a transitional footings and your 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 building is sitting on soft soil, the building will settle and depends on how deep that soft soil is, the building might not settle uniform uniformly. So okay. the building either tilt to one side or you see cracks on okay. the building. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so soft soil caused the tilting house to tilt. And I guess that's unfortunate, um, but but uh, it is what it is. Any other questions from people attending tonight? Uh, just use the reaction buttons, raise hand function, and or turn on your screen, and we'll take your question. Seeing none, back to the commission for more discussion or motions. And David Morgan has his hand up. Just wanted to suggest the bunch berry to replace the switchgrass because it's also a dogwood, it's a dwarf dogwood, um, and it gets eight or 10 inches high, but it'll match the flowering dogwood, so it'll look very intentional in that space. Also native, also suitable for rain gardens. Just wanted to throw it out there as a, as a good option. I didn't get the name, David. Uh, here's a link in the chat. Bunch bag is a common name. Okay. So I'll wish out to you, um, David, and get the exact species so you can make those changes easy. Okay. Um, motion to close the hearing. I have a motion. I have a second. Second. David Kaplan, Mike Gildas game, uh, Nathaniel Stevens. Um, I'm not eligible. I missed the prior. Sure. Time. Sorry yes. about that. Uh, Susan Chapnick. Yes. David White. Yes. David Kaplan. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yes. And Chuck Taroni says yes. Okay. So let's discuss conditions. So there's signage for the rain garden. Remove the switch grass and replace it with another another native species. I think that uh, Chi and David will talk about that. Sounds like David's got a handle on something he wants. Um, add the um, modular block to the plan and a, 
and noted on the plan what you're doing, and that'll be the final plan. The commission doesn't have to see that, but it needs to be with David prior to him issuing. Um, talk to the town tree warden about any trimming on the town property, park or road. And we want root protection, and I want to come back to that, and tree protection. Now, if you're driving over the roots and you can't put down the uh, fence on the root perimeter, then you're going to have to bring in plates. You're going to have to bring in something to spread the load so you're not crushing that ground. So you might take the house down and try to drive through that area. Maybe that makes more sense and then work your way from the back forward. But mm -hmm. that's that's a condition. You, if you can't, you know, protect the roots, you're going to be put down, you're going to put down plates. Um, and that's what I had. Does anyone else on the commission have any other conditions? Oh, and then any severed roots I want cut clean. And if you sever roots on more than one side, I would like an arborist to look at it after you cut all the roots clean and see if they need to be treated. So I'm from what Sean said, I don't think we're going anywhere near that, but it's going to be a condition. Yeah. Yeah, Susan. Yeah, I just want to make our standard statement that our standard conditions for vegetation replacement would apply in the rain garden area. Which which have to do with survivability and reporting to the commission, and um, that area has to be maintained in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. We already talked about the signage, and you can't use any chemicals in the in that area. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, Good. I'm just going to clarify the signage on for the rain garden. We and since you're updating the plan, could you put? It's up to you to purchase and design that sign. So could you put uh, how it's going to be installed and the uh, the text in the plan since you're doing an update? Yes, okay. we have. Um, but so how high do you have a standard, I guess, would be the question. Mm -hmm. Obviously, above mowing height, but do you need a yeah. like three foot height or do you? Like 16 inches, you know, something like that, 12 to 16, I think would be fine. Okay. It should look appropriate. I, I think one is fine, just some yeah. informational signage. A like conservation area type thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and I'm going to I'm gonna say, if David doesn't like the language, he's going to work with you on something that works, David Morgan. So. Okay. Um, yeah, just pass it by him before. Certainly. Thank you. Okay. Any others? Seeing none, can I get a uh, motion to issue with the conditions we just discussed? Move, I move to issue with the conditions. Mike Gildas game, have a second? No second. David Kaplan. Um, Susan Chapnick. Yes. Yeah, uh, David Kaplan. Yes. David White. Yes. Mike Gildas game. Yep. And Chuck Taroni says yes. And again, this is um, approved under both the Wetlands Protection Act and the Arlington Bylaw and Regulations. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. Well, that's it. So uh, yeah. anyone t attending tonight would uh, have any uh, comments that we wouldn't otherwise have known 48 hours in advance? Seeing none. Um, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. There's a hand up. Uh, that was for the last, I think he just, it just wasn't put down. That was for the last hearing. I just, I just, he was talking, that was Bill. Um, so I have the uh, motion. I have a, uh, do I have a second? I'll second. It's a David White seconds. Okay. All in favor, just raise your hand and this meeting's Aye. over. Hi, right, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Okay. Okay. Good See night, you in everyone. September. Thank you. Everyone. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a song. See you in no September. <laughs> ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.